now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale completely <laughs> unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11pm and repeated every morning at 5am. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are, we don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? <laughs> Apparently. Uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no, no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. It's 9.30 on Wednesday, the 19th of April. This is To The Point with Andrew Pearce and Bev Turner on GB News. Sunak talks tough on eco-protesters. They should be ashamed of themselves, he said. But isn't this just more words with the London Marathon now possibly under threat? Outrageous. And another month of more inflation. Uh, it's fallen, but food, food prices are still soaring. Why are supermarkets charging us so much? Sturgeon under pressure to quit the party that she led for years. We'll discuss motorhomes, donations, arrests and the former First Minister's soap opera future. I don't think she's got one. And the Coronation Cross is going to use shards they claim was used in Christ's crucifixion. Well, that's what they tell us. <laughs> we'll have the latest on relics and royalty. We'll tell you the shocking number of protesters that are mm. apparently coming down to London this weekend. You honestly will not believe the figure. Let me know on all the all we're talking about this morning. GB Views at gbnews.uk. But first of all, here are your news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Very good morning to you. It's 9.32. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Inflation has fallen, but not by as much as had been expected, with food costs at a 45-year high. It was predicted the cost of living would drop below 10% for the first time since August, but it currently stands at 10.1%, down from 104 the previous month. The savings on lower fuel costs have been cancelled out by soaring prices for bread, cereal and fruit. Uh, clothing and footwear prices also rose. The Chancellor says the government must continue to drive down inflation to ease pressure on families and businesses. 
The government's plans for an asylum centre in Essex will be challenged in the High Court today. Braintree District Council argues the proposed site at RAF Weathersfield is unsuitable because of its isolated location and lack of capacity for local services. The government says using disused military bases to accommodate migrants will reduce reliance on hotels. The sack boss of the CBI says his reputation's been totally destroyed following misconduct allegations. Uh, Tony Danker was sacked last week over claims he sent staff members unsolicited messages. And while he's apologised for conduct that may have made some colleagues feel very uncomfortable, Mr Danker says he's wrongly been associated with, associated with separate allegations, including rape, which predate his time at the CBI. He claims he's been made a fall guy for a wider crisis within Britain's biggest business lobbying group. And the Prime Minister says disruptive climate protesters should be ashamed of themselves. Rishi Sunak's comments comes after activists disrupted the World Snooker Championship on Monday and the Grand National at the weekend. Speaking to The Sun, Mr Sunak says those who disrupt sporting events ruin the hard work of others and should be ashamed of their selfish behaviour. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn. This is GB News. Now it's back to Andrew and Bev. So the Prime Minister's talked to The Sun and said the behaviour of protesters like Stop Oil, Extinction Rebellion is outrageous, selfish and reckless as we have approached the London Marathon, which could be frankly, destroyed by this shower. Mm, it comes as environmental groups, including Extinction Rebellion, prepare to flood the capital with 30,000, that's right, environmental activists during the London Marathon this weekend. Jacob Rees-Mogg, our very own, was talked to a Just Up All spokesman last night on GB News. Uh, this is what was said. We are looking at what the climate crisis is, is a red light for humanity. Study reported Jacob, will by will you be joining uh, us on the 24th Orson. of April at 1pm for a marriage to end new oil and gas from No, Parliament no, Square. of course I won't, because I want my constituents um, to have to warm homes. climate crisis. I want them to have warm homes but what and have economic have? prosperity. We are already seeing crops burning in the field, no, Jacob, but this, it already this, gets us so far, Jacob. This crisis isn't there. It's invented. By whom? Who is benefiting? You. By you're, me you're, personally, you're, yes, you Jacob. You are part of a yes. system that wishes to frighten people into having a lower standard of living. I don't... Good for you, Jacob. Well, that was Sean Irish from Just Stop Oil speaking to Jacob Rees-Mogg last night on GB News. Well, the Prime Minister might be talking tough, but these protests have been going on for a while. July last year, six people were arrested at the British Grand Prix, for instance. After five activists invaded the track, all six were convicted of causing a public nuisance. Guess what? We've got suspended prison sentences and community service orders, which they can go and do it all over again. And last October, activists brought traffic to a standstill in central London. Six of them have been found guilty of willful obstruction of the highway. And in November, it was them again, just up oil, four days of flipping protests. On the M25, 58 people were charged, one activist jailed for six months. Not long enough. No. And then on Monday night, uh, Just Stop Oil targeted, of course, the World Snooker Championship in <laughs> Sheffield. Uh, two people have been arrested. These were the scenes uh, there on Monday evening. Ridiculous. Yeah. So I'm, I'm still struggling to think, Bev, what snooker has got to do with um, carbon emissions, uh, global warming? And I'm even more so... The London Blimmin' Marathon, where people are actually running active transport on their own feet. Olivia Rutley joins us now to discuss this. When you look at it like that, a, a collation of, a collection, if you like, of, of events that we've put through, that's even just a small part, mm. Olivia, of what we've been dealing with. Rishi Sunak, of course, said earlier in the week, we should be ashamed if we can't do maths. Well, he's now saying you should be ashamed if you're protesting. And in a way, when he uses it about maths, it undermines the power of saying it about people like, like this. What do we know he's going to do at the moment? What, does he have any plans to do with it? Well, he does have a plan, but quite a lot of his backbenchers feel that it's a little bit slow and are getting a bit frustrated with it. The way he aims to address this is through the new public order bill, which he put on the table late last year. And what that'll do is uh, beef up police 
powers to intervene in protests before they take place. So, for example, one of the tactics that Just Stop Oil uses are slow walking protests, mm. which massively hold up traffic, cause huge disruption um, in the centre of London. And at the moment, there is nothing that police can do about it. Under new uh, legislation in, from the public, Order Act, uh, police would be able to ask, force those protesters to move from the road to the street if they see a if they see a protest taking place. So it's all about allowing police to intervene before the disruption has happened. But of course, that was talked about late last year. Yeah. It's still going through it's conversation that, we're stages. We're nearly in May. We're nearly in May, and uh, who knows how long but, it's going to be? And of but, course, it's a, it's a controversial bill because some people feel that it well, stomps down on, on rights protests. It, because I actually think stop these people in their tracks. I know you're worried about the, the right the to protest. The longer implications yes, but of But the fact is, people are stopping, they're preventing people going to work, low-paid people going to work, people who work in hospitals, porters, people going to work in their, 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 their cars, mm. people trying to get to hospital for cancer appointments. It's outrage. And this is the biggest outrage, isn't it, Olivia? The London Marathon, people train for that all year. It raises <laughs> millions, as you know, for charity, and they're planning to put 30,000 activists in London this weekend only 40,000 take part in the race. It will be unforgivable. I think it's, half, isn't it half a million runners we have. Now? I am quite worried about it because I am running the London Marathon on Sunday. You are is it your first one? I am. It's my first London Marathon. Well done, you. And but I've how been... does this affect your preparation? Well, I am quite worried about it because I've run 600k in the last uh, four in months. Miles. I'm old. Oh, 400 miles or something? Well, no, more that's than a that. Lot. More than that. Yeah. Quite a bit more than that. Um, Yep, and I am hoping to do a very good time, but it does make me feel a bit uh, anxious and it does seem a bit of a strange, as you say, mm. uh, event to protest when, what's, of what's course, that got to millions with, would be raised like, for charity and, and also people what's are moving on to foot. Do with warming up the, 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 the planet. Absolutely, although I suppose a, a don't stop, just stop oil activist would argue that uh, it, it raises awareness for their cause and for them that is the most raises important jury. thing. And I think it's about half a million people apply. Yeah. And then about 50, 40,000 do actually yeah. run it. Not, not everyone finishes but, it, of course. But people do marathons all over the country. Yeah. It's a, it's, it, I think this would be the one, to, maybe this is the one that's the straw that breaks the camel's back because it is such disabled people, people in wheelchairs, so many people, fat, thin, dressed up in costumes. It's quite a life-affirming event as well. But as look, you're about to discover, we hope. <laughs> but we this, hope. this public order bill, though, Olivia, the reason it was controversial, it is controversial, um, remind me who I want to say that it was Pretty Patel, was. wasn't it? It was. That, was. that first of all suggested this. And it came during lockdown periods. I feel like 2021, it's been bubbling away. It has been bubbling away since then. It, th Anyone who is uh, a proponent of the public order bill argues that it will only be used. It, it is the purpose of it is to stop uh, specifically environmental protesters who use these guerrilla tactics. But of course, there is a danger that with wide-ranging legislation like this, fine at the moment under this particular Conservative government, it'll be used to stop the guerrilla protests uh, from from. Just stop oil activists, but of course it could be used for any other protest at a later date. And you know, we live in a yeah. free country, and we do expect the right to to protest peacefully. So it is a controversial piece of legislation, which is pretty bad news uh, for anyone worried about these. Uh, events because it is going to take an awfully long time to get through Parliament. It's going to get held up in the Lords and, the and it doesn't get held up in the Commons. It, 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 what's saying, it's when you find that the police are not just not moving on the protesters, they're giving them sunblock. But that's, I mean, it's pathetic. But you see, that's why people become... It's lily-livered policing. But, that's, but, that, but you see, people who know much more about the detail of this, lawyers that we've interviewed before... Human show, rights. Well, they will say the police already have these powers. Yes, I'm sure that's right. They have they these just don't powers, use them. but for some reason, they're not using them. Now, some people would say, well, maybe they're not using them because they know that the government wants to push through the public order bill and create more powers to control the populations in ways that we could never imagine. I think it's just think, useless policing. Why aren't they, why aren't they think, doing it? I don't it? see a smell of conspiracy. I just think bad policing, or, or, too much bad policing, think... too much wokery in our policing. There is an argument for that. The police would argue that when they go, when they crack down on protests, like they did on the uh, Sarah Everard yeah. vigil, uh, they get in trouble for that. So they might say that they they can't. They were wrestling women to the ground, <laughs> and protesting a... about a murder by a woman of a police. But you police see, officer. this is why. But this is why people like me stop and wonder what is going on in the bigger picture here. Is this? A... I'm not suggesting 
that there are necessarily government uh, entities which have infiltrated these groups, although we do know that that has happened in some countries around the world, in order to activate this sort of hysteria around these events. Some of these people in these organisations, they're, they're quite, these, these protest groups, they're quite kind of vulnerable individuals. They're easily manipulated. It only takes one person within Just Stop yeah. Oil to say, I, I was talking to somebody recently whose wife has got involved in these activities, and he said, I don't recognise her anymore. It's like she's joined a cult. Yeah. It's like she's become brainwashed. And now she, you know, now that she's, she's out there every day and she's devoting her life to this, well, be really careful what you wish for because your right to do a peaceful protest will go. Mm. Well, what I find quite interesting about it is the fact that uh, Extinction Rebellion and Just Stop Oil, there seem to be some tensions between those two groups. Yes, I because think Because Extinction right. Rebellion, which was the original group, it's a more organised group, uh, a bigger group, has said that it won't disrupt the London Marathon if it can possibly help it because, it said, it recognises that people empathise with its cause mm. but don't like the way it's going about it and they want to get more people on side. So so they're sort of getting a bit softer, willing to compromise, yeah. whereas the Just Stop Oil activists have become the sort of Fanatics. guerrilla uh, uh, faction of this group. I, I, I love the headline in The Sun about that idiot who disrupted the snooker the other night. Just posh off, because he's another posh son of a very rich family, too much money, no sense, doesn't have a job. Go and get a job, mate. He needs a good dose of therapy, that guy. When I saw him interviewed, I thought, oh, you've got some issues which you're channeling into your... I think, am I allowed to say he needs a good kick up the... Probably not. <laughs> Probably not. I think, I think therapy it. might be a more it. acceptable I'm suggestion. Not mad on therapy. Um, <laughs> Olivia, we're going to keep you in the studio. We're no pun to... intended. No, exactly. We're, we're going to Northern uh, Ireland, aren't we? I think so. So Rishi Sunak uh, returns to Northern Ireland today to deliver the closing address at a gala dinner marking the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Tony Blair will be there, Bill Clinton. Let's give credit where it's due. They were key figures in delivering it. I'm not quite sure why the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen has to stick a nose in, but she'll be there in the conference too. So let's speak now to Doogie Beattie, our Northern Ireland reporter, who is in the city. Big event again this morning. Uh, Doogie, it's been a week of them. It has indeed, and thank goodness this is the last of them today. <laughs> yes, we've had the politicians of the past. They've all been here. As Mark Longhurst said, the band got back together. We had all the big names from the Good Friday Agreement 25 years ago. And today we are having the politicians of this era, we have uh, Leo Varadkar, the Irish Taoiseach or Prime Minister. We have Ursula von der Leyen, the EU, EU, uh, EU Commission. And we have Rishi Sunak. Now, this is very much a carrot and stick approach. And the pressure here to go back into power has really been on unionism throughout this whole uh, conference. So yesterday, uh, Chris Heaton-Harris, the Secretary of State, very much in his speech warning unionism if they did not rejoin the institutions of the Good Friday Agreement, uh, that it would put the union under threat. And today, Rishi Sunak's speech is uh, apparently to address and look at where he's saying that he is going to make Northern Ireland the best place to do business. Meanwhile, you have unionists that have examined the document saying it will cost business in Northern Ireland. And tonight at the gala dinner, you will have those that actually put the Good Friday Agreement in place and the three decades of killing and violence in Northern Ireland. And on the other side of the room, you will have those and it is rumoured that Liz Truss and Boris Johnson may indeed be here. Uh, that will be one heck of an interesting gala dinner to be at. Thank you so much, Doogie. Oh, well, <laughs> he says he's, he's glad it's if the last one of the week. With it, I know. If he's exhausted with it. he's exhausted with it. Always uh, lovely to see your yeah. face, Doogie. Yeah, it's, uh, a, it's been a big story for Belfast. And yeah. I, I, Olivia's still with us. Olivia. I, I predict the DUP will be back in that power sharing thing quite soon. And they're going to have to, it's going to stick in their craw because it means the Sinn Féin will be the first time have the first minister. Yeah. That's a big moment in Irish history. <laughs> well, absolutely. History. And that is if, if, DUP, if the DUP do agree to no. get back into a power-sharing agreement because that, no. that will be they tough. To. They're going to get whacked in the next local election. So the, it, I think, I mean, there, there is an argument that the DUP just sort of get whacked, whatever it does, yeah. if it does go back into a, yeah. a power-sharing agreement uh, with Sinn Féin, with Sinn Féin as First Minister, they could see quite a lot of their votes be siphoned off into the TUV and other yeah. harder-line unionist groups. So the DUP has got itself in quite a sticky position at the moment. It's hard to see a when way you out. Look at, when you look at sort of uh, Northern Ireland and you look at Wales, English politics seems quite... Quite, oh. quite straightforward I know, at the moment. I know. If all Richie Sunnett's got to deal with is a few protesters. 
It's sad that John Major's not there because yeah. he was a key figure before he started this process boat while he was still Prime Minister. Tony Blair took it on brilliantly, I'm not taking away from him. But he's not well, otherwise he would have been out there. Yeah, that is uh, that is sad. Uh, he was a, a very big figure in it. And in fact, all of the uh, living former Prime Ministers were invited. And sadly, John Major can't make it, and nor can uh, David Cameron or Gordon Brown. Although Liz Truss would be there. Funny uh, that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's an action. Very good form in the House of Commons. Very good form. Um, uh, Wales, let's talk about that uh, for a little while. Hamza Yousaf. Um, Scotland. Gone. Scotland, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Thank you don't for reminding it, me. Don't if it Humza Yousaf was. What did they do to deserve uh, sorry. him? Sorry. We're jumping around this morning, aren't we? Uh, Humza Yousaf uh, obviously had a tricky kind of maiden <laughs> speech this week. How do you think he did? Well, I mean... He it did was... make a nod to it, didn't he? He said, it's, there are challenges which come with being First Minister. Yeah. And it was a ripple of laughter around yeah, the Yeah, I mean, completely impossible circumstances yeah. to make your big speech on your plans for yeah. Scotland in, in the years ahead. Uh, it, it almost completely went under the radar. One thing I did find interesting was he didn't actually talk about independence very much, which just yes. shows the position that the SNP has got itself into. One of the reasons Nicola Sturgeon resigned, and perhaps there are more obvious reasons mm. why Nicola Sturgeon resigned, is that there didn't seem to be a, a legal route to another referendum, which is, of course, what she wanted. She had said that she wanted to make the next general election and all subsequent general elections into de facto referendums, and that was not popular among the SNP, mm. which might have uh, helped her in her decision to resign. But it also leaves the SNP in a very difficult position of not knowing how to proceed with their new referendum. So Homes of Youth, actually, was was focused mainly on domestic Scottish politics, which yeah. uh, I, makes I, a bit I'm of struggling to just think of such a catastrophic implosion of a ruling party in such a mm. short space of time. I didn't believe a word of it when she said she was standing down because she'd run out of juice in the tank, whatever it was. I always thought it was to do with this police investigation. But, by God... Her husband arrested, the treasurer arrested. Lots of speculation about what questions she'll have to face. Yeah, and and there are there are some people within the SNP who are who are actually on on watch for Nicola Sturgeon's arrest mm. yeah. uh, itself in in the coming days. And it's really interesting to see the extent to which the SNP, which was such a united party, yeah. we never saw any splits from within the uh, SNP higher echelons. Well, there are now splits absolutely everywhere. SNP senior officials are briefing left, right and centre against Humza Yousaf for not suspending Nicola yeah, Sturgeon amazing. from the SNP. Yeah. And her husband. And her husband. Uh, so, yeah, the, the cracks irony, are really course, showing. The, the, the irony in this, I keep thinking about Kate Forbes, yeah. who... It looked like she'd been, you know, defenestrated from that leadership battle and it looked like her sort of SNP frontline c career was kind of juddering to an end. She's now waiting in the wings. She is. Looking a little bit cleaner than the rest of them and might actually come back in yeah, good time. Yeah, she wasn't around when a lot of these terrible decisions were taken. And actually, I think it'd be right... Look, a lot of people say, how can she be first member of Scotland because of her views? Yeah. Because she doesn't believe in sex outside of marriage, she doesn't believe in same-sex partnerships. So what? doesn't stop you doing your job. And she is quite popular in Scotland yes. as a whole, if and not the among the SNP membership. Mm. The Tories fear The Tories her, do fear her. a lot of Tory votes, I yeah. think. Whereas Humza Yousaf is, as they say, useless. <laughs> right, thanks, Olivia. OK. Get back to training for the marathon. <laughs> you should just Off talk you go. to do with three hours, 20 <laughs> what? minutes. Your first one? <laughs> My second one. She's fast. What was your first one? Uh, Edinburgh, I did 3.33. No, Remarkable. God, Chasing around after those MPs every day keeps you fit, doesn't it? Now, the National Lottery is famous for supporting good causes. But a GB News investigation has revealed the National Lottery Heritage Fund has been used to support political causes, including a speech that described Conservative politicians as devils. Which ones? GB News' Charlie Peters has this exclusive report. What would you do with six-figure lottery winnings? It's a question lots of Britons dream about answering. But for a collection of activists, that dream became a reality in 2021 when the National Lottery Heritage Fund awarded almost £250,000 to a group called 81 Acts of Exuberant Defiance. The Social Change Project was launched with support from campaign group the Ubele Initiative to mark the 1981 Brixton riots. The money has helped the group put on 81 different events, which call on people to resist the whitening of our history but GB News can reveal that some of the lottery funding has gone towards supporting a political speech by an activist, breaching the fund's rules. Campaigner Stafford Scott gave a talk at a Brixton venue earlier this month, which accused the royal family of being involved in slavery. He slammed the Met as a gang executing black kids, 
and said the government's crackdown on gangs was fascism. Scott used his lottery-funded talk to describe Boris Johnson and other politicians as devils. And this man, this devil, you know Mopac, right? You need to know them, the mad devil. Is they are devils, and I'm going to show you that they're devils. This woman's called Sophie Linden. She's the deputy mayor for policing. Right now, right, she a devil. Tory MP Brendan Clark Smith said that lottery funding should not be used to promote political causes. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I think when people play the lottery, they want to see that money go into good causes, and a lot of it does, of course, and we want to see that spent in our communities properly. What we don't want to see it being used for is these political causes, things that actually cause more tension in the community. And I think that's why it's really, really important not just to look at the applications, but the organisations as well to make sure that this doesn't happen in future. The National Lottery Heritage Fund said they do not define heritage. They leave it up to applicants to make their own understanding of what it is. Do you think that this talk that was funded £4,000 counts as heritage? Well, heritage can mean a lot of things, as we've said there, but I don't think many people would call this heritage at all. And as I said, we want that money to be spent properly. I think a lot of people feel very let down, certainly seeing some of the comments that have been made and where that money is going. But I think this is a wider problem that we've got here. I mean, we have charities, we have community interest companies that really are vehicles for some quite nasty political views. And this is not really where money should be going. It's not in the spirit of the sector. And I think something needs to be done about it. A National Lottery Heritage Fund spokesperson said that its funding should not be used to promote political beliefs, adding that it had been in touch with the Ubele initiative to discuss how the project would be delivered. They say that your odds of winning the lottery are 1 in 45 million. But it seems that the chances of your £1 going towards funding political activists is much higher. Charlie Peters, GB News, Brixton. So still to come, the SNP is in turmoil with some calling it a meltdown following the arrest of Sturgeon's husband and the party's treasurer. That's next on GB News, Britain's News Channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's News Channel. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Monday to Thursday, 9pm till 11pm, join me, Dan Wooten. I'll bring you the sharpest takes and hottest debates. Do you okay. not believe in prisons? I, I don't believe in prisons. I'm completely right. stunned. I guarantee you there'll be no spin, no bias, no censorship. I actually was personally quite offended by it. <gasps> and no reason to go to bed. So I guess they've always been quite woke. That's Dan Wooten tonight on TV, radio and online. Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. We are GB News, the People's Channel. And right across the United Kingdom. You can find us on Sky Channel 512. Virgin Media Channel 604. Freesat Channel 216. Freeview Channel 236. And UView Channel 236. You can also take us with you on DAB Plus Radio. With the GB News app and at the website gbnews.uk. We're absolutely everywhere. Come join us on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Start the day with GB News.
We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Join us every Saturday from 8pm as we debate the week's stories, controversies and issues. With us four, plus a special guest. It's five times the opinion, five times the debate and five times the fun. The Saturday Five. Saturday nights from eight. Only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. You can wink at the end. I can't, but I can't Britain's wink, listening. <laughs> I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. morning. It is 10 a.m. on Wednesday the 19th of April. This is To The Point with me, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. On GB News, now we're talking Sunak. He's talking tough on eco-protesters. They should be ashamed of themselves, he says. Haven't we heard this all before? Particularly now the London Marathon is under possible threat. Another month of double-digit price rises. We've all noticed it with the cost of food still surging. Are the supermarkets protecting profits at the expense of us? And is Nicola Sturgeon going to quit the party altogether that she led for years? We're going to be discussing motorhomes, the nation's arrests, and whether the former First Minister has any future. She hasn't. And the Coronation Cross will contain shards used in Christ's crucifixion. Or well, so we're told, we'll have the latest on relics and royalty. When we say relics there, with that picture of Prince Charles... We don't mean we, Prince... We no, don't know the just king. Just to be clear, we're talking He's, about... Don't forget, Prince it's the Charles. king now. King Charles. Honestly, I think I'm not going to sleep last night. Right, let us know your thoughts on everything we're discussing this morning. GBviews at gbnews.uk is the email address. But first of all, here are your news headlines with Aaron. Good morning, it's 10 o'clock. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. Food prices have risen to a 45-year high, putting further pressure on families struggling with the rising cost of living. Inflation has defied predictions by remaining above 10%, largely because of soaring prices of essentials like bread, milk and eggs, along with clothes and shoes, which have only been partly offset by cheaper energy. It makes another interest rate rise from the Bank of England next month more likely, the Chancellor says the government will continue to focus on driving down inflation. Well, this is a small headline fall, but it disguises a large rise in food inflation, which is causing pressure to families up and down the country as they see their cost of their weekly food shop go up. And it shows that there is no such thing as an automatic fall in the headline rate of inflation. That's why we have a plan. And if we're going to reduce that pressure on families, it's absolutely essential that we stick to that plan and we see it through so that we halve inflation this year, as the Prime Minister has promised. Now, the government's plans for an asylum centre in Essex will be challenged in the High Court later. Braintree District Council argues the proposed site at RAF Weathersfield is unsuitable due to its isolated location and lack of capacity for local services. The government says using disused military bases to accommodate migrants will reduce reliance on hotels. The sacked boss of the CBI says his reputation's been totally destroyed following misconduct allegations. Tony Danko was dismissed last week over claims he sent staff members unsolicited messages. And while he's apologised for conduct that may have made colleagues very uncomfortable, Mr Danker says he's been wrongly associated with separate allegations, including rape, which predate his time at the CBI. He claims he's been made a fall guy for a wider crisis within Britain's biggest business lobbying group. 
The Prime Minister says climate uh, disruptors should be ashamed of themselves. Rishi Sunak's comment uh, comes after activists disrupted the World Snooker Championship on Monday and the Grand National at the weekend. While speaking to The Sun, the Prime Minister says those who disrupt sporting events ruin the hard work of others and should be ashamed of their selfish behaviour. Well, meanwhile, uh, the Prime Minister will uh, deliver a closing address at a conference in Belfast later to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Rishi Sunak will vow to give everything to tackle the problems of a divided society in Northern Ireland when he speaks at Queen's University later. Now, the DUP leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, uh, maintains that unionist concerns around the protocol must be addressed. They're refusing to go back into power sharing. In the shadow, Northern Ireland Secretary Peter Kyle told GB News the anniversary should be celebrated. People seem to be focusing on the political challenges we have uh, in Stormont at the moment, but don't forget that 25 years ago the Good Friday Agreement delivered peace. It ended armed civil conflict here in Northern Ireland, and it's been incredibly successful. It's been an enduring peace. Of course, the politics has been harder to achieve and some of the institutions set up by the Good Friday Agreement uh, are, are not up and running at the moment. That's something that perhaps we'll, we'll talk about, but we should never forget the achievements that were, uh, were, were delivered by that fantastic generation 25 years ago. The Labour leader has pledged to bring back Tony Blair-style NHS targets to cut waiting times for patients. Sir Keir Starmer has set out his vision for reform and rebuilding healthcare ahead of the general elections, uh, potentially the local elections next month, I should say. Speaking to The Telegraph, uh, Sir Keir says he would bring back single-sex hospital wards and follow a target-driven system. He has also accused Conservatives of breaking the NHS system, but the government says it's working to cut the waiting lists. The former Holyrood Finance Secretary says the SNP is facing a critical moment and needs urgent action. Kate Forbes, who was defeated in the leadership contest to succeed Nicola Sturgeon, has spoken out following an investigation into the party's finances. Colin Beatty is the second person to have been questioned by police. They are trying to establish how more than £600,000 in donations set aside for an independence referendum has been used. Uh, earlier this month, the SNP's former chief executive, Peter Murrell, was questioned for more than 11 hours by detectives. Some parts of England are becoming so-called dental deserts, or de dental deserts, I should say, following the NHS dentist shortage. That's according to the Liberal Democrats, who say some areas have a 3,000 people per NHS dentist. Well, the party is calling for affordable dental care, but the government says it's preparing to announce further measures to improve access to NHS dental surgeries. Former cabinet ministers say a new deal on worker sick pay is necessary. Priti Patel and Sir Robert Buckland are calling for simple tweaks to statutory sick pay. They say making sure people are paid from day one would boost the economy. Latest figures show an all-time high of two and a half million people off work due to long-term sickness. And the King's coronation procession will be led by a cross that includes relics given by the Pope. King Charles was given two shards of the true cross by Pope Francis to mark the occasion. It is said to be the same cross used in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The small fragments uh, of it have been incorporated into the Cross of Wales, which will be seen by millions as it is carried into Westminster Abbey. This is GB News. More as it happens. Now it's back to Bev and Andrew. So the... So the government stop the boats policy involves getting people out of hotels, illegal migrants out of hotels, and putting them in military bases, camps, and Braintree Council, Tory controlled, is now applying for an injunction to halt it. A local MP happens to be a member of the cabinet, no less, uh, James Cleverly, the Foreign Secretary. That's How right. ridiculous. <laughs> the, the Home Office plans, still plans, to use sites in, in Essex, we just mentioned, Lincolnshire and East Sussex, to provide accommodation to several thousand asylum seekers. Mark White is our Home Security Editor. Morning, Mark. Are you, where are you, are you at court or are you in Essex? Are you at the High Court? Yeah, good morning to you both down at the High Court. This really is a very important case 
for the government to win because it's really crucial in terms of the plans to push ahead with more uh, purpose-built, larger accommodation centres for asylum seekers that can stop the government's over-reliance on hotels. We currently have 51,000 asylum seekers in hundreds of hotels right across the country at a cost of more than £6 million a day. That is unsustainable, according to Prime Minister Rishi Sunak and Home Secretary Secretary Sue Ella Braverman. Um, so the battle today is all about uh, the former RAF base uh, at Weathersfield near Braintree, uh, plans there to house up to 1,800 asylum seekers on that particular former RAF station. Uh, the local council, local people in the village of Weathersfield and surrounding areas say it's completely inappropriate because there are no facilities. I was down there a few weeks ago. There is one very small village shop and nothing else for these young male asylum seekers to do. Uh, they would not be detained in the base. It's not a detention centre. They would be allowed uh, to wander uh, in and around Weathersfield and indeed go further afield. It's completely uh, sort of unsuitable according to uh, those campaigners uh, and that's what they will be arguing in the court but the government is effectively going to declare a national emergency today as far as the small boats crisis is concerned this would allow them to adopt class Q uh, in response so this class Q order effectively gives the government in an emergency situation the power to overrule any objections by local planners, by local authorities, as long as the development is on a Crown estate on a government-owned land, such as this Ministry of Defence site. It'll be up to the courts, of course, whether they accept that as an argument from the government. Pretty embarrassing for Rishi Sunak, isn't it, when one of the most outspoken opponents of this plan is his own foreign secretary? Well, there's no doubt, of course, local MPs right across the country and the Foreign Secretary is one, uh, have very difficult decisions to make as to, you know, whether to go with government policy, which he absolutely should do in a collective car cabinet, but also with an eye to uh, the very deep anger that there is among his own constituents. But make no mistake, this is vital for the government in this policy of trying to come up with a solution that stops this over-reliance on hotels, which have angered many, many people right across the country, because what you have, especially in smaller communities, is sometimes the only facility in that community in the form of a hotel, which is used for weddings, funerals, other sort of public events, and, of course, attracts tourists and other visitors to a location, being taken out of commission, uh, being handed over to the Home Office uh, effectively uh, for a year, maybe two years, to house these migrants. So the government knows that that is a very unpopular policy. They need to find solutions. One way of doing that is these bigger purpose-built or adapted uh, detention or, I should say, accommodation centres. Uh, they've faced such stiff opposition, though, every time they try to do this. You'll remember, Andrew and Bev, uh, Linton on Ooze last year in mm -hmm. Yorkshire, the RAF base there, a yeah. big public campaign against that, the local council threatening legal action, the government backed down. Remember the plans to put asylum seekers in Butlins holiday camps, big opposition campaigns, and the government backed down. Also, a university up in Hull, big protests again and the government back down. They can't keep doing this if they are to find a solution to the over-reliance on hotels. OK, thank you, Mark. Mark White there. Fascinating, isn't it? So this is such a significant it is. case today. But James Cleverly has a 25,000 majority in Braintree. He's obviously worried that this could cost him his seat at the next yeah. election. So he's thinking of a local, as a local MP yeah. rather than a member of the Cabinet. OK, the latest inflation figures have been released, showing that the rate fell to 10.1% last month, down slightly from 10.4% in February. Who's going to give us some more insight? This is our very own economics and business editor, Liam Halligan.
Thanks, Andrew and Bev. Inflation did stay stubbornly high during the year to March, 10.1%. A lot of people, not least a lot of people in Downing Street, were hoping that inflation would finally fall back into single digits. The fact that it hasn't means that there's more likely to be an interest rate rise when the Bank of England meets next month. Let's have a little look at the detailed data. You can see that in October 2022, inflation peaked at 11.7%. It came down to 10.7%, 10.5%. In February, inflation was 10.4%. It went up and now it's 10.1% this month. And there are those numbers. What's actually driving inflation in March 2023? It's basically housing and it's utilities and it's the cost of food. Housing and housing services, they're up 26.6% in March compared to March 2022. Now, that number does include utilities. Many of you will say, but my utilities have gone up by much more than 26%, and they have. And that's why I personally think that that number is an underestimate. The detailed utility data, the cost of retail gas and electricity, those numbers will be released later. But here for me is the real shocker, the price of food up 19.1% during the year to March. That's a 45 year high. And why is it so shocking? Because what this graph shows is wholesale food prices around the world. And they have fallen now 12 months in a row, a big downward trajectory down by a fifth. And yet food retail prices have gone up. And that's why I think the government will be talking to the retailers about why food prices remain so elevated, why they're spiralling food price inflation when wholesale food prices are falling. Now, food supply chains are complex. There are big lags. Farmers take, you know, months, years to produce their crops. But look at some of this. This was not ONS data. This is not official data. This is from which the consumer group, they surveyed eight supermarkets. I reported this data yesterday, but it seems opposite today in Asda, a sliced white loaf is 67% more expensive in March than a year ago. In Ocado, a 49-gram porridge pot, 66% more expensive. And in Tesco, eight sausages, 73% more expensive. And I think food price inflation, because less well-off families spend so much more as a share of their income on food than others, will become very politically controversial. But there are signs of hope. The first sign of hope in these numbers is that motor fuel inflation was actually negative. In other words, motor fuels on average petrol and diesel were cheaper in March 2023 than in March 2022, though only by 5% and less so for diesel, of course. But this is also a sign of hope. This is the producer price index. This captures the cost of the inputs that firms need to create the goods and services that they then sell us. And you can see their producer price inflation is down sharply from 12.8% in February to 7.6% in March. And ministers will be clinging to that as signs that inflation is soon going to ease. What does all this mean in sum? This is a big headache for government as well as households across the country. Inflation in the US is 5%. In the Eurozone, it's 8%. So Britain does seem to have an inflation problem. What I would say is that this makes an interest rate rise more likely next month. And the cost of living crisis, it's not going to go away anytime soon. It's going to continue to dominate politics, not least before those crucial local elections in May. Well, Thank you, Liam. Depressing, isn't it? Yeah, brilliant, though. Thank you. What an amazing explanation. There are questions that need to be answered there, particularly about... Get those supermarket bosses into number 10 and sort them out, because I think they're operating a cartel. I know Liam will tell me for saying that, but Liam, I've said it. They're right. operating a cartel, <laughs> in my Rish view. Rishi Sunak says that the behaviour of protesters who disrupt sporting events is selfish and reckless as he pledges to push ahead with legislation to crack down on public order offences. Environmental groups like Extinction Rebellion, they're now planning to flood London with 30,000 of their irritating supporters to try to disrupt the London Marathon this weekend, which is outrageous. We're joined now by our favourite public affairs expert, Piers Pottinger. He's talking tough. We've heard it all before, Piers, haven't we? Yes, we have. And um, I'm not quite sure what he's going to do about it. But the, it seems to me very clear that we live in a democracy and I totally support the right of everyone to demonstrate or protest. But demonstration and, and protesting does not equal disruption. 
And when you disrupt people's livelihoods, when you stop people going to work and going about their normal business, or whether you do some preposterous stunt, uh, on, like at the snooker tournament, I mean, this is just vandalism, and it is, in my view, criminal. And I do hope that the police, um, who always seem to say that the, their hands are tied, I, I don't know who by, mm. um, if people are clearly breaking the law and preventing people going about their normal business, they should simply be arrested and, I think, given proper jail time. Well... I was just going to say, one of our viewers has got in touch, Philip. He says, here in Germany, the German judiciary and the government have taken a strong line against activists who disrupt roads or glue themselves to things. They get done for criminal damage. We could do that here. Why aren't we, Piers? Well, I agree. I, I don't quite understand um, why they can't do that. Uh, it should be done here, as it is in Germany. And again, of course, the other thing is some of these protests are not really about um, what they're protesting about. They're more interested in just sort of anarchy for the yeah. sake of it. Obviously. And the, these are uh, young people who, uh, as uh, I think many people feel, would be better gainfully employed doing a job of work, perhaps helping create some wealth in this country, yeah. instead of going around with preposterous suggestions. I mean, you can't stop oil overnight. You can't do it in 10, 20 years. Every sensible person knows that. So stop um, trying to... Um, push an idea that no one is going to get behind. You're a great horseman and you would have been encouraged, I think, that the police actually did get to grips with those wretched people at the Grand National. Yes. They've potentially 30,000 people targeting the London Marathon. Now, forgive me, Bev and I haven't worked out quite what threat to the environment the London Marathon is triggering. How are they going to deal with 30,000? I don't know. I mean, with the Grand National, the police had plenty of warning. They did. Um, thanks, thanks to the Daily to, Mail. Thanks to the Daily Big Mail, indeed, who, who leaked... Uh, well, not leaked, they, they went undercover and, and found out the plans. Mm. But the police should be doing that. That's their job. And they, yeah. if there's something on this scale, they ought to be prepared, they ought to be ready, and they ought to be dealing with it very firmly indeed. Wouldn't it be popular with the voters, please? Hugely popular, I think. Most most voters, including Labour supporters, um, are totally against this kind of disruption, as I say. Protesting's one thing, but disruption is another. But here's the thing, I guess. When it's on an, on an eco-zealotry ticket, which is what these idiots are doing, all of our MPs are also trying to jump on that eco-bandwagon most of the time. We hear about net zero, net zero all the time. And maybe that for MPs there's a kind of a a sort of hypocrisy they could be accused of if they're stopping the activists who are apparently supporting the aim of the government to get us all off oil. It, it's a messy political situation for them. Well, I, I don't see how you can call the kind of protest these people um, and do uh, as supporting anything. They're, they're destructive. I and, agree, but the, and, and... the cause is such. If it was any other... You feel like if it was anything else, yeah. if it was anti-meat or... But they damage their cause, Bev, don't they? They do. They, they do. Really well, do. Greenpeace discovered this when, if you remember, they had that boat that would yes. go around and interfere Waving. with other boats and mm. it was almost piracy. Yeah. And that actually, there was a huge backlash against them. <clears throat> um, as indeed polls today, there's a huge backlash against the advertising by the Labour Party attacking... Rishi Sunak personally in the most disgraceful way. Yeah. And it's, it proves my point I made earlier on this programme that, um, that attacking people in advertising in such an unpleasant and personal way is, is not... It doesn't work. Let's it's counterproductive. Let's talk about the Scottish National Party, because we talked on this programme a couple of weeks ago when Peter Murrell, yes. the chief executive, yep. that was Mr yep. Nicola Sturgeon, if we can yep. call him that, arrested. Yep. Uh, now the Treasurer yes. has been arrested. Yeah. What, what's going on here with well, your great... <laughs> I mean... As a great Scot here, yeah, you must well, be very I mean, I'm very depressed them, because, I mean, if they can't run their own party, you can't expect them to run the country. Yeah. And, in fact, they've, had, they've got a hopeless record anyway. Yeah. And uh, Humza Yousaf, the, lead, the First Minister, yesterday's speech, simply reversed or said they were going to reset the, some of the unpopular policies that they were going to do. But I think there are two significant things in, with the SNP saga at the moment. One is three officers of the NNP signed off on the last published accounts of the party, and they were Peter Murrell... Arrested. Colin Beatty... Arrested. ..and Nicola Sturgeon. So she was the third one to sign it off. So she, therefore, 
was obviously a party to the state of the affairs, at least at the time of the last accounts, and one wonders where that is going to lead the police. The second and most important thing of all is the Lord Advocate, who is in fact a lady called Dorothy Bain, and an SNP minister appointed to the role of Lord Advocate by Nicola Sturgeon. She is in charge of the Crown Prosecution Service. In now, she's the senior law officer in Scotland. Now, the police said and repeated yesterday that they will, following their investigation, send a report to the Crown Office headed by an SNP minister appointed by Nicola Sturgeon. Now, I think um, Dorothy Bain has some questions to answer. She's inferred vaguely that because if there is any political investigation, she would be not involved. That's not good enough. That really isn't good enough because the murkiness and, and the depth of murkiness that's going on in the SNP is shocking. And if, if, if I had a vote in Scotland, I'd be really wanting an immediate election in Scotland to, to, to deal with this SNP bunch because they're clearly not fit for government. And, you know, when um, Theresa May stood down, when uh, Boris Johnson stood down, she demanded, Nicola Sturgeon, a general election. They're not mm. saying the same in Scotland, are they? No. No, 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 no. Yeah. I mean, it, it's... It, and Nicola Sturgeon's uh, carrying on as if there's nothing to be worried about. Mm. Well, I mean, it, it's just absurd and no-one buys that. Um, and they hide behind there's a criminal investigation going on. Of course there is. Yeah. But they need to do a lot more than hide behind that. Yeah. Stay with us. Piers, thank you. Right, still to come, Rishi Sunak is in Northern Ireland today to mark the closing address at the gala of the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. We'll tell you who else will be there in just a moment. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. Oh, I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything. I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things. We've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you And whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you know All Kate Moss? Rooms, apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I have walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale completely <laughs> unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said at the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. So we're going to go straight to Northern Ireland because it's a very big day where the peace process can talk to our very own Doogie Beattie. Doogie, who's going to be at this big gala dinner? Well, the gala dinner tonight, it is rumoured that the gala dinner will, will have past and present PMs. That would include Boris Johnson and Liz Truss. That would be an interesting conversation, yeah. especially in amongst those that are here celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Of course, in amongst those are uh, Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Tony Blair. They all put three decades of violence in Northern Ireland to an end. And this, this conference is to close with... Um, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, the President of the US uh, or the European Commission, um, President William J. Clinton making his speech. We then have Leo Varadka, the uh, current Taoiseach or President or Prime Minister of the Republic of Ireland. And then uh, it all ends up with Rishi Sunak. And really, this is a carrot and stick process over the last couple of days for unionism. Uh, Chris Eaton Harris was in yesterday. Uh, and in the, his speech, he very much set out that if unionists do not go back in, to the Stormont institutions, those institutions set up for power sharing as part of the Good Friday Agreement, how to govern Northern Ireland, that uh, it would weaken the union. Uh, and today, Rishi Sunak's speech is very much expected to say how he will make Northern Ireland one of the best places in the world to do business. And, of course, unionists are very, very upset about the framework document that is in place and what restrictions that actually puts in Northern Ireland. They are very much saying that it pushes business towards the Republic of Ireland. The Republic of Ireland, of course, denying that. But when you look at, at how many taxation, including corporation taxes and the movement of goods inside Northern Ireland, it would be hard to see why how Rishi Sunak can not just use sound bites, but actually explain to us in real terms how this can be a good place for getting business into Northern Ireland. BT in Northern Ireland for us. Uh, Piers Pottinger is still with us. Piers, Tony Blair rightly gets a lot of credit for the Good Friday Agreement with Bill Clinton, but we should give credit to, to John Major, who started the process. He sadly can't be there today because he's not very well. He's 80 now, after all. Yeah, I'm sorry he's not there. And you're quite right to point that out because uh, John Major really did start the process. Tony Blair has, of course, uh, capitalised on the success and never stops um, telling everyone how he brought this about which is in part true, and to be fair to him, he worked hard at it, um, although some, some of the aspects of it that we've seen, such as the letters to um, former IRA terrorists, uh, as, uh, essentially absolving them of the atrocities they were involved in, I think uh, he should not be forgiven for. Yeah. Um, I also think the gala dinner will probably be um, quite lengthy, given the number of speeches. Oh, yeah. <laughs> At when... least Joe Biden's not there. Yes. Um, because in some ways, that he, he was, of course, make a short speech, and it could be quite funny yeah. because uh, he would make so many gaffes. We're, we're a little short on time with you as well, Piers. Um, Piers yeah. Pottinger. Some people may not know, but you were the uh, you created Bell Pottinger, the biggest ad, one of the biggest advertising agencies in the world. I think it's fair to say. Particularly yeah, at one point, country. yes. At one point, <laughs> with your advertising yeah. agency hat on, can we ask you about this story that's been in the press this week about Budweiser and also Nike, two huge global brands, using Dylan Mulvaney, a trans woman, to advertise their products, and the backlash has been huge. Why would they choose to use him in their advertising? Well, I think they use yeah. the, 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 the person um, because... Yeah, script, very tactful. <laughs> to... Because uh, they thought it was a kind of woke, cool idea and would appeal to the young. Uh, and its backlash mm -hmm. is, is huge on both, for both brands. It's done them enormous damage uh, it, very, very quickly. And that's something that these days happens. When a brand goes wrong, it goes wrong very fast. And, I mean... Investors, too, in some of these big companies have been telling 
for example, Unilever, to stop doing all this woke socialising and preaching to their customers and get on with the business of selling shampoo and butter. Yeah, quite. Very political now, isn't it? Every brand, every, every yeah, advertising. Yeah, and, and... There was a fashion for yeah. people thinking, oh, we, we'll make our brand cool by saying woke things and doing very sort of... Uh, uh, sort of... Uh, playing to the, a young remember, audience. Yeah, and we should remember how tiny and minuscule the trans population of this country is, so why on earth are they using them to promote And in a beer America, actually, less and than and train issues. No, And it hasn't worked, and it won't work, and hopefully people will realise and take that message on board and get on with promoting brands for what they are. Yeah. Great to Thank talk you, to you, Piers. Piers Pottinger, as ever. Still to come, MPs are calling on police and the judges to clap down eco fanatics. We've been saying it here for ages. Why don't they just get on with it? More, find out more now with the headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Good morning to you. I'm Aaron Armstrong. It's 10.33 in the GB newsroom. Uh, inflation has fallen, but not by as much as expected, with food prices at a 45-year high. Uh, the cost of living was predicted to ease, but inflation currently stands at 10.1%, down from 10.4% the previous month. Savings on lower fuel costs have been cancelled out by soaring prices for bread, cereal and fruit. Uh, clothing and footwear prices have also gone up. It makes another interest rate hike from the Bank of England next month more likely. The government's plans for an asylum centre in Essex will be challenged in the High Court later. Uh, Braintree District Council argues the proposed site at RAF Weathersfield is unsuitable due to its isolated location and lack of capacity for local services. The government says using disused military bases to accommodate migrants will reduce reliance on hotels. The sack boss of the CBI says his reputation's been totally destroyed following misconduct allegations. Tony Danko was dismissed last week over claims he sent staff members unsolicited messages. And while he's apologised for conduct that may have made some colleagues very uncomfortable, Mr Danko says he's wrongly been associated with separate allegations, including rape, which predate his time at the CBI. And the Prime Minister says disruptive climate protesters should be ashamed of themselves. Rishi Sunak's comments come after activists disrupted the World Snooker Championship on Monday uh, after similar disruption at the Grand National at the weekend. Speaking to The Sun, Mr Sunak says those who uh, ruin sporting events for other people uh, spoil their hard work and should be ashamed of their selfish behaviour. TV, online, DAB Plus Radio and on TuneIn2. This is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. Quick look at the markets today. The pound will buy you $1.2433 and €1.1350. The price of gold, £1,592.53 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7,883 points. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News, investments that matter. Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's all ready and waiting. They're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. 
Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, 3 till 6. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. 3 till 6 p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching. Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7pm. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I had my chip... Oh, we're back in vision. Sorry, we're all having a good chat here. Nobody like, told you, us we were you, back. And you could hear Stephen Pound talking out of turn in the corner, of course. Emma Stephen Webb and Pound Stephen Pound MP. are in the studio. <laughs> Just warning you, we may not be able to hear the gallery, but anyway, anything could happen. This is GB News, of course. <laughs> to the point with me, Bev Turner and Andrew Pitt. And we're going to, before we get to the papers, we're going to just read out a couple of some of your views because a lot of you are very exercised. Quite right about those wretched Extinction Rebellion types. Roy says, I'm thinking of organising a protest to protest against protest. <laughs> which will cause even more chaos. Absolutely. But, uh, we, we're with you, Roy. We yeah. understand. Should we, should, in fact, we're going to talk about this. One of our, our big stories of the day, isn't it, Stephen Pound? What do you think about this? Don't we already have enough legislation? Don't we have the powers in place to move yeah, people of course, on? Of course we do. I mean, you know, just people are being far too squeamish about this. I mean, I like the idea of protest against protest against protest. Yeah. Should I be gluing myself you know, to someone called Tristram? You know? yeah. <laughs> are you suggesting they're all middle class, these protesters? No, they're middle class? Good yeah. Lord, no, they're yeah. much posher than yeah. that. The head <laughs> headline in the yeah. sun is posh off. <laughs> well, about <laughs> but, the, I mean, the the, the, this chap, who, I mean, I have to say, lucky he got away without being lynched at the crucible. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I mean, his name is Ed Red, as yeah. opposed to Red Ed. It's Ed yeah. Red Whitting, you know. Yeah. Mm. And, I mean, it, it's marvellous. But the thing is, this person, would you believe it? He's actually gone on trying to crowdfund. So he said, if I don't get some money, I may have to work in a pub. You know, <laughs> I mean, you know, by the way, what is a pub? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you think, Emma? Um, well, I, I'm very frustrated with this constant desire to always in introduce more legislation to deal with these problems. The problem is that the current law is not being enforced. That's exactly right. Um, I think that the reason why we're currently in this situation with the potential for 30,000, I don't think that's actually going to happen no, in their not. dreams, 30,000 people to descend on the London Marathon to mm. cause complete chaos, um, interrupting other sports, sporting events, things like snooker, um, I think that we're in this situation now because we didn't nip it in the bud early enough. Mm. And I, not to say I told you so, but I've been saying for years now that with these eco-activists, you allow them to break the law, even if it's a mi minor, you know, just <coughs> giving, sending them the message that if you break the law in pursuit of your objectives, that we're going to allow you to get away scot-free, th the result of that is escalation. And there have been e experts in extremism and terrorism that have been warning for quite some time but if you do allow these sorts of movements, and there have been eco-terrorists in the past, not to say that that's what this group are or will become, but you, you do have to acknowledge that there are some very extreme people in the eco-movement, mm. and that if you do allow them to break the law, there is a potential for these things to escalate. And so we, we really do need <coughs> to just quite straightforwardly, as, as Lee Anderson quite rightly put it, arrest these yeah, people, put them in yeah. jail, the, the come thing, down on them with the full force of the law. And the trouble is, uh, the police seem to assist them in breaking yes. the law. 
escorting them when they're doing their slow program. Well, you have them sunburned. Well, they, they could be dancing the Macarena, obviously, you know, just to amuse people. But then what really, really annoys me, Andrew, is that there is a very powerful case to be made, which Emma and I may not entirely agree on, on global warming and, you know, the dangers to the environment. And that's being lost because of all this flim flam, all this nonsense. So it's actually demeaning the cause, it's distracting it's, from it. And that is really bad. It yeah. seems that Extinction Rebellion actually now are sort of distancing themselves from Just Stop yeah. Oil yeah. 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 because it's... they know that they need to get people on side. You, you're alienating the majority of the population. Actually, I think, I mean, the, the Grand National is an example yeah. of this with the animal rights activists, but we've seen it in so many other the examples. Snooker on, the snooker at the weekend. Some of the, the more extreme um, people within this movement mm. are willing to put people's lives at risk. Yeah. If you do something like the suffragettes did, mm. uh, and, we, and I don't think that they sh we should al allow them to compare themselves to the suffragettes. No. But running on to... And the suffragettes did put people's lives at risk. Well, hang on a second. The suffragettes um, had no democratic recourse. The suffragettes yeah. weren't, they yes. were not allowed to vote. These people are allowed and to vote. And they know that and if they ran for parliament, then they wouldn't... Well, they'd, they'd be... Direct, yeah. But the thing is, there, there's something so stupid about it, so facile, so puerile about it, when they say, oh, we're attacking the crucible because, you know, they, this is, they're snookering. You know, the climate change is snookering the world's future. I mean, what sort of a ridiculous... <laughs> what are they teaching them at Eton <laughs> nowadays? Every time they run in front of a car, yeah, yeah. I don't mind if they risk their own lives and risk their own yeah. health, but what about the people driving the car? Yeah. The damage they're going to cause? The, oh. the more over pressure on the over LHS and, over again. and yeah. people not being able to yeah. get to work, people not being able to get to hospital in an ambulance. No. It's unforgivable. Well, do you remember what happened on the DLR last year when they, they, they tried to climb up on the roof and all the commuters dragged, they dragged them, them yeah. off? Yeah. Which is what we should do. Yeah. And in France, you watch the police do it, they drag them off the road. So why so, are the they police. still get arrested? They will. See, we're still not getting to the root of why the police yeah. aren't doing it. Is it because it's seen as somehow a virtuous... Because it's not somehow. Categorically, we're all meant to be eco-warriors <laughs> now, aren't we? We're well, all not. meant to be well, on board with the eco-zealotry. <laughs> that seems to be the unanimous uh, ethos, the ideology that we... That, that, if you're not allowed to <laughs> question it. On the BBC, you cannot question... Green well, ethos. No, no, but I have to say, I, I know a lot of police officers, you know, mostly from, you know, around football and things like that, they are the least woke people in the world. I cannot imagine a whole lot of police, particularly the Met, they're not going to say, oh, no, we mustn't get involved here. It's the boss class, then, isn't it? You know, it's I mean, the boss class. Yeah. It's absolutely... It's a, because the thing on the, you know, it, it is a, a military structure. It's hierarchical. You get the instructions from above. And they've obviously been told, go easy on them. You know, they don't want to have the pictures like that. They have happened at the uh, Sarah Everard... Uh, do you remember yeah, the, the, vigil. the vigil when this, this woman with the picture you saw in all that the was, papers? All yeah, I agree, but, you know, is it beyond the wit of the Met to mm. actually do both things correctly? That's to right. actually police a protest? Common sense. And, yeah, well, absolutely. Common but, sense policing? Well, that, you know, what a slogan. Let's you know, go for that. I think we've heard that one somewhere before. <laughs> was it a Tory slogan? <laughs> and, <laughs> What's happened to it? I, I, I think that what we've been seeing for, for years now is actually is a kind of ideological two-tier policing because if you look at other examples as well, the Black Lives Matter protests are a great example because that criminal damage took place there. Mm. The police stood by and let it happen. Yeah. The, a building that I work in got vandalised um, by Extinction Rebellion and the police did absolutely nothing um, about it while it was taking place. So... I think that they, not just with, with um, eco causes, but they've, the police have sent a message that if you are, if you are um, you're striving after an objective that is noble and virtuous and the sort of, um, the, the, the orthodoxy of society, mm -hmm. quote unquote, because That's I think right. the majority yeah. of people probably don't agree with it, mm -hmm. that, if, that if, they are, um, if they are doing this for certain progressive causes, then they will be let off lightly when compared. It, you just have to who, who, who are they to decide what is who the makes the decision? I mean, yes. you, you, the you and I were there. What we, is the normal? Well, do you remember the two huge demonstrations? I remember very much. You know what your comments at the time when we had the, the pro fox hunting demonstration yeah. and, and the anti Iraq war. Now, now, who makes the decision that you know one is orthodox and one isn't? Yeah. You know, I'm sorry. The law has to apply to every single person. Yeah. The law is the last bull, but the first bull of democracy. You've got to get the law right, and we're all equal under the law. It shouldn't be up to someone to say, oh yeah. They're good, they're bad. Yeah. No, I'm sorry, it's just nonsense. Common sense policing. You heard it here the, for the second time. From me. <laughs> and the police officers would say, we would love to exercise yeah, sure our common would. sense, but we will get... But the governor says no. Yeah, yeah. 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 The right. woke so, Metropolitan Police Commissioner. Talking of woke, Disney oh. addressed Mickey Mouse in a Pride costume at its first Pride night. Just explain this to us, Emma. What does that mean? Well, this... <laughs> explain it if you can. <laughs> this is um, part of the ongoing war between Disney and the governor of Florida, Ron DeSantis. Who we um, like. 
They is quite misleadingly referred to in all of the papers as the don't say gay bill. That's not quite what it is. It's about making sure that children aren't being taught things that are inappropriate and possibly a safeguarding risk. And so um, as part of this war, it seems that Disney have decided not in Florida, but in their California Disney World um, to host this um, Pride event with Disney characters dressed in Pride costumes. Um, and it's, oh, it seems to be a sort of provocation, but also possibly a little bit of woke washing from mm. the corporation. But the, the situation in Florida is that um, Disney actually have special status. They have special tax status. They have their own um, police. They have their own fire think? service. Do you think? Um, really? So they almost operate like a kind of... State Mickey, within a state. A, a Mickey Mouse principality. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and um, Ron DeSantis has been threatening to take away this status um, because of their because exceptional... Republican frontrunner, of course, potentially. Exactly. And actually, you know, the same goes for the Metropolitan Police. You could very easily accuse them of woke washing, given all, all the things that have come out about um, the Met, that um, Disney has a certain... Uh, historical ties to things that the, the woke progressive causes would certainly not agree with. Um, and so it's possible that, you know, this is um, th this is a case of an, yet another corporation really trying to firmly put their flag um, in the woke territory and be a, be a player on that, that. That's a beautiful understatement. I mean, yeah, Walt Disney was further to the I mean, right than the soup spoon, <laughs> wasn't he? I mean, you know, I mean, there certainly was a great long tradition he'd of that. Be, he'd be spinning in his grave. Eh? Absolutely, absolutely, because he'd be behind you. He'd say, you don't go far enough. But you know, I can remember having a, a great debate in the House of Commons about, well, you know, the great gay men and women who contributed to history. And somebody said, of course, you know, Plato was gay. And I said, what, Mickey Mouse's dog was gay? <laughs> it's interesting. <laughs> what, do they know? So, what do they know Plato was gay? <laughs> who said he was? Um, well, I mean, I, I mean, in Roman... And well, there weren't well, quite there a lot of them gay. They, they, they do say that... The, they, Israeli was gay because he well, had a close male... Well, well they did say yeah. that the Greeks invented the art of sexual love, but the Romans introduced yeah. women into the equation. <laughs> Yeah, with the, yeah, I think that's true. But listen, just just think <laughs> how about, do we know? Well, <laughs> well, how do we know? We don't know. We do know a bit about the cultural practices yes. in, in classical yeah. times because yeah. we can read about it, and there was certainly a, a, a sexual fluidity. Let's say beautifully put. Thank you. Women for procreation, but boys for pleasure. Right. <laughs> um, but when Calm it comes down, to, Steve. When it comes to the Mickey Mouse thing, so what are they trying to do? I guess what they're trying to do is to ensure that the next generation of children as they grow up do not. Uh, a carry homophobia mm. within them. And I imagine that you would probably applaud I would that, that very course. much, considering yeah. that, that, you know, you had tough times. I did. So, in that respect, mm -hmm. OK, but this is what I've got a problem with. It's making children think about sexuality. Mm. Too young. Too young. What is, what is too young, though? Because, I mean, when I was seven, at primary six. school, we thought about little else. <laughs> but, did you, but you didn't think about homosexuality when you were six or seven. I'd never heard of it when I was six or seven. Yeah. Never heard of it. I remember my father telling me, he says, if you go into a pub and there's men wearing yellow socks and they offer to buy you a drink, leave. <laughs> no, I think it's a bit, uh, a bit early in... <laughs> <laughs> and did you ever go into a pub with a man with yellow socks? I've never yeah, seen one. Yeah, he's got a free drink every time. <laughs> <laughs> Can't take him anywhere, can you? But early in the morning to yeah. mention um, French philosophers like Foucault and Simone de Beauvoir. But, <laughs> um, <laughs> but I think that their argument would be that six-year-olds do need to be taught about sexuality. They would say that, that children they? have sexuality. I'm not saying Disney would say this. I'm saying that there are certain... Um, progressive woke intellectuals who would make this argument. So I think the issue here is a conflict over what adults believe is appropriate for children. Yeah. There are many people, particularly in Florida, who want to protect and safeguard children. Mm. And also, you, I think a, a, one aspect of this has got to mm. be the fact that it's actually quite prevalent amongst some adults that, you know, going to Disneyland, it's not just a kid's Thing anymore, and I think that there's this blurring of the line between adults and well, children. This, this is about power. Look, this is about, two of them about power. Mm. Walt Disney, the Disney Corporation now yeah. isn't just about Disney World. Yeah. It's actually about Hollywood. It's about theatre. It's about film. Mm. Um, it's about streaming videos. Mm. So what the, they cannot afford to upset that, that Hollywood thing. So Mike, it's about power. Can we just allow children to be children? And just grow up as. That's what it, Disney should be about. Yes, exactly. The, so the challenge but when does a child stop being a child? We, how do we allow children to be children yeah. without growing up being homophobic? Well, I didn't grow up being homophobic. 
But you grew up with uh, with people who were homophobic. Yeah, but but but, but 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 we're much more worldly now. Kids are no. I know. Oh, no, you don't need Disney to no. grab it down kids' throats. I frankly. don't think you need to dress um, Mickey Mouse and uh, Minnie Mouse up in, I agree. in LGBT costumes no. in order to convince children to be nice to one another. I agree. Yeah, I, I, I think the rainbow. There's nothing sacred. The way they've appropriated the rainbow yeah, is, yeah. is a fascinating yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of. Yeah. That's what children now we used to be able to draw a rainbow. It's just a lovely rainbow. It's a natural feature. It, it meant there were going to be no floods. That's what I was taught. Indeed. Yeah. That's what, that's yeah. what I was taught. I went to Catholic well, school. Well, I was no always floods. told that there was a pot of gold at the end of it, just if yeah. you know where to find it. And did you ever find it? No, I kept looking. No, but, I mean, when, when I was in school, all we knew about gay people was Kenneth Williams. You right. know, and it was that sort of rather and fake... And came out. Actually. You know, who, who never did. No, but never it was all, did. you know, sort of men throwing a light dart. Yeah, it was, yeah. It was, and, and it was... It, there was something rather unhealthy about that, because we, we were laughing not just with them, but sometimes at but them. Stephen, that was 85 years ago. And Things well, a bit, a bit longer than that. But we've moved on from that. We have. That's why why I'm with Bev. I think Bev has actually got a very important yeah. point there. Yeah. There's also we're... another very, very briefly important point to make, which is that it's the, the, the idea of putting together the L, G, B and the T together. Actually, there are many people who are very plus, plus. concerned that trans activists are actually being really quite homophobic. So uh, I think that is a really good point. Uh, it was always an issue for me about why we went from L, G, B. Why did T get involved? Yeah. Well, they're not Q gay. plus. They're not gay. No, no. Trans people are not gay. I don't understand it. You'll have to take it up with Stonewall. Yeah. <laughs> Not to um, answer for. Or Mickey Mouse. He might have an yeah. opinion <laughs> soon. Uh, right. Uh, UK and China, Stephen, The Guardian. The UK must not pull mm. the shutters down on China, cleverly warns the Tories. This is a difficult balance to get right, isn't it? Our relationship with China, mm. how not to alienate them, mm. but also not to condone some of their activities. How well, this, this is... I mean, James Cleverly has made this statement, and some of which is, you know, Department of the So-and-So obvious, because he said, China is very big. <laughs> and I said, well, no, you know, thank you. <laughs> Second biggest economy in the world, of course. Yeah, yeah, but he also goes on to say, and it's, got, it's an important player in, the, in, the, in, in environmental issues. Well, yes, they're opening new coal-fired power stations yeah. every couple of days. Look, yeah. what, what, what he's, he's saying is that on the one hand, we've, we've got a, a, sort of a group of people within the British Parliament who quite rightly are very, very upset about technological interference, particularly in IT systems from yeah. China. You know, the Huawei, Huawei all, that, yeah, all that business. On the other hand, people like Cleverly are saying, well, hang on a second, you know, if they're not going to trade with us, who are they going to trade mm. with? What he doesn't realise, and I, I mean, I'm sure he, he does in his heart of hearts, says, countries don't have allies, they have interests. Mm -hmm. And if you honestly think that China is going to lie awake at night thinking, oh, we must not have the <laughs> United Kingdom, their interests are in Sri Lanka, in Mozambique, in right the way across Africa, right the way across the, the Caribbean. Their interests are global. And Russia. Well, I was coming... Now, that is a real tricky one, because mm. that is the one thing that could tip things in Putin's favour. Absolutely. You know that, and, I, and that's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, yeah. he, I mean, but one of the few world leaders he still talks to, of course, yeah. Putin, is President Xi in China. We yeah. should and be worried about that, shouldn't we? We, we should also, be don't forget, they're also in Afghanistan, because they're after the lithium for the mobile phones. Well, what is it... Right. If you go to virtually any, any West Indian island, you will find a, a new concert hall being built, a, a civic centre, and, I mean, if, even in places like Zambia, not as I was there but a couple of years ago, there are brand-new buildings all over the place. And the Chinese workers, they don't contribute to the economy, they live in, in, in enclaves there. And it's terrifying. It is, it is a global imperialist urge, which is typical of China. Emma, China. I, I think that you know, James Cleverly seems to want us to have our cake and eat it. Um, I think that the way that have he's our phrased... Have <laughs> The way that he's, he, he's phrased his response to people like... <coughs> um, <coughs> by Ian, Ian Duncan Smith saying that we're asleep at the wheel, I think Ian Duncan Smith is right. I think that he's equivocating. Um, he said things we're like... We're going to have to go to the break, Emma. We'll, we'll come back to you. But um, um, look, still to come, inflation's fallen, but not by as much as it should have done. We'll find out more in a second. Hello, Alex Deegan here with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Most of us having a dry day today. Quite a few of us seeing blue skies through the afternoon as well. But there is an easterly breeze still bringing a bit of a chill to some North Sea coast. Thanks to this area of high pressure sitting to the north, the uh, wind going around the high pressure clockwise, so drawing in that chilly feel on these North Sea coasts. But for the west, in the sunshine again, western Scotland probably seeing the highest temperatures. Quite a bit of cloud over England as well. Seen some showers this morning over the southwest. They are tending to drift away now, so most places will be dry, staying fairly cloudy over parts of the West Midlands, Wales and southwest England, but turning sunnier over eastern England and plenty of sunshine for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. 18, 19 in western Scotland, 11 or 12 on that east coast, that will feel pretty fresh. 
it'll turn quite t chilly overnight as well as the cloud tends to melt away in most places. We'll see a bit of cloud developing over the Pennines, but uh, generally it'll be dry and clear through the night. Enough of a breeze to stop temperatures dropping too far, but it will be quite a fresh start to Thursday morning. Some pockets of frost possible across parts of Scotland uh, through the sheltered glens here. So a fresh, bright start to Thursday, plenty of sunshine around, could still be fairly cloudy over the Pennines, and some cloud may develop at times on the east coast. And later in the day, notice this area of cloud moving in across East Anglia and the southeast, perhaps bringing some late showers. But for many, it's uh, another sunny one to come tomorrow. Again, quite cool on the east coast with that brisk wind, but for the west, temperatures are a touch above average in the mid or even high teens in places. That cloud and showery rain will start to edge in further across the southeastern corner of the country during Thursday night, and that signals a bit more of a change as we head into Friday and the weekend. Certainly for England and Wales, more cloud and some heavy showers possible on Friday, where Scotland and Northern Ireland stay sunny. Things turning colder across the north during the weekend. It's all about family. Being in people's living rooms, all the interaction and getting to know who our viewers and listeners are. When I was young, my dad used to say, no, no, stop arguing. I wanted an outlet that would enable me to give my opinion. People are going through a really hard time right now. And I know that you don't feel like you're being listened to by the establishment. I came to GB News because it's the people's channel and I want the audience to have their say on the events of the day. We're dynamic. We do something different. Democracy shows that the wisdom of the nation is in its people. I get to travel to find out what the story is from a personal perspective. The British people aren't fools. We know when we're not being told the full story. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. It's the best country in the world. The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent your views. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hello, I'm Michelle Jubery, and you can join me every weekday, six till seven, on Jubes and Co. You're uh, an inspiration to us all. Clip that bit off. Well, you are. You, you, my, you, you, no. my political ambitions are <laughs> those days are gone, I can tell you. She's um, only teasing. Go on. He's probably going to want to lay down now. I'll give him two minutes to have one. Let's respectfully disagree. That's what we like Absolutely. on Jubes and Co. Come and join us, GB News, the People's Channel. Michelle Jubery, weekday evenings at six o'clock. Start the day with GB News. We catch up on all the big stories you didn't hear the night before. And take a look at what the world's talking about this morning. That's right, Monday to Thursdays from 6 o'clock. It's Breakfast with Eamon and Isabel. Straight after breakfast, join us, Bev Turner and Andrew Pearce. We're going to take you through till noon. We'll be tackling the big topics of the day, including the things that the other channels just won't talk about. If it's happening, it's happening here. Wake up to mornings on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. I'm Simon Evans. Join me on GB News for Headliners at 11 p.m. What's the scoop? I'll be joined by two of the country's top like, comedians. Yeah, that's right. As we take a look at tomorrow's newspapers tonight. We're going to get into trouble. If it's a big story, we'll be covering it. Spill some tea on him. There we go. <laughs> but we'll also have some fun. I wouldn't stick up a bank. <laughs> My father didn't love me. So anyway, Headliners every night from 11 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. We've got a brand new lineup every Saturday night on GB News. From 6 p.m., I'll give you my unique take on the world today. Then at 7, it's me, Calvin Robinson, with my common sense crusade. New to GB News is the Saturday Five. Five times the opinion. Join us every Saturday from 8 p.m. as we debate the week's stories. With us four, plus a special guest. And at 9, of course, it's Mark Dolan tonight. Brand new Saturday nights on GB News, Britain's news channel. It's 11 a.m. on Wednesday, the 19th of April. This is To The Point on GB News with me, Andrew Pearce, and Bev Turner, of course. Lots still to come this morning. Supermarkets in the dock. Food prices on the shelves soar as wholesale prices drop. Are profits coming before customers as inflation stays above 10%? And Rishi Sunak, he's talking tough on eco-protesters. They should be ashamed of themselves. They should be because they're going to target the London Marathon this weekend. Can you believe that? Sturgeon under pressure to quit the party that she led for years. We'll discuss motorhomes, donations, arrests and the former First Minister's future. 
and they're telling us that the Coronation Cross will contain shards using Christ's, cru Christ's crucifixion. That's what we're being told. We're a bit sceptical. <laughs> Emma Webb and Stephen Pound will be back in the studio with us as well to tackle some more of the day's big stories. But first of all, let's get the news headlines with Aaron Armstrong. Very good morning to you. It's a minute past 11. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB newsroom. Food prices have risen to a 45-year high, putting further pressure on families struggling with the rising cost of living. Inflation has defied predictions by remaining above 10%, largely because of soaring prices of essentials like bread, milk and eggs, along with clothes and shoes. And that's only been partially offset by cheaper energy. It makes another interest rate rise from the Bank of England next month more likely. The Chancellor says the government will continue to focus on driving down inflation. Well, this is a small headline fall, but it disguises a large rise in food inflation, which is causing pressure to families up and down the country as they see their cost of their weekly food shop go up. And it shows that there is no such thing as an automatic fall in the headline rate of inflation. That's why we have a plan. And if we're going to reduce that pressure on families, it's absolutely essential that we stick to that plan and we see it through so that we halve inflation this year, as the Prime Minister has promised. The recently sacked boss of the CBI claims his reputation has been totally destroyed following sexual misconduct allegations. Tony Danker says he's been wrongly associated with an allegation of rape that allegedly took place before he joined. And he's been made a fall guy for a wider crisis within the business lobbying group. The CBI fired Mr Danker and suspended three other employees earlier this month, stating his conduct fell short of what was expected. He's acknowledged he made some staff feel uncomfortable over unsolicited messages and has apologised. The government's plans for an asylum centre in Essex will be challenged in the High Court later. Braintree District Council argues the proposed site at RAF Weathersfield is unsuitable due to its isolated location and lack of capacity for local services. The government says using disused military bases to accommodate migrants will reduce reliance on hotels. The Prime Minister says climate protesters who disrupt sporting events should be ashamed of themselves. Just Stop Oil protesters forced a stoppage in play at the World Snooker Championship on Monday. 118 demonstrators from the Animal Rising campaign group were arrested at Aintree after delaying the start of the Grand National at the weekend. They've also vowed further disruption this summer until the government agrees to its demands which could affect Wimbledon, the Open Championship and the British Grand Prix, not to mention the marathon this weekend. Meanwhile, the Prime Minister will deliver the closing address at a conference in Belfast to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. Rishi Sunak will vow to give everything to tackle the problems of a divided society in Northern Ireland. The DUP leader, Sir Geoffrey Donaldson, though, says unionist concerns about the protocol must first be addressed. Shadow Northern Ireland Secretary Peter Kyle told GB News the anniversary should be celebrated. People seem to be focusing on the political challenges we have uh, in Stormont at the moment, but don't forget that 25 years ago the Good Friday Agreement delivered peace. It ended armed civil conflict here in Northern Ireland, and it's been incredibly successful. It's been an enduring peace. Of course, the politics has been harder to achieve and some of the institutions set up by the Good Friday Agreement uh, are, are not up and running at the moment. That's something that perhaps we'll, we'll talk about, but we should never forget the achievements that were, uh, were, were delivered by that fantastic generation 25 years ago. The Labour leader is pledging to bring back Blair-style NHS targets to cut waiting times for patients. Sir Keir Starmer has set out his vision to reform and rebuild health care ahead of the general elections uh, coming up next year and the local elections next month. Speaking to The Telegraph, Sir Keir says he will bring back single-sex hospital wards and follow a target-driven system. He's also accused Conservatives of breaking the NHS, but uh, the government says it's working to cut the waiting lists. Health workers will stage a fresh waves of strike Strikes next month in a long-running dispute over pay. A Unite says its members 
at some of the trusts, that's including South Central, South East Coast and West Midlands Ambulance Services, will take part in industrial action on the 2nd of May. Meanwhile, the union members at Guy's at St Thomas's in London and Yorkshire Ambulance Service will strike on the 1st of May. The SNP is facing a critical moment and will be in trouble unless decisive action is taken over its financial crisis. That's according to Kate Forbes, a former leadership candidate to succeed Nicola Sturgeon, who spoke to the BBC following police investigations into the party's finances. Colin Beatty is the second person to be questioned by detectives. They are now trying to establish how more than £600,000 in donations set aside for an independence referendum had been used. Earlier this month, the Scottish National Party's former chief executive, Peter Murrell, was questioned for more than 11 hours. Heathrow Airport's launched an appeal against the decision that it must cut charges for airlines. It comes as the Civil Aviation Authority uh, said the airport's average charge per passenger must be reduced by £6 over the next three years. But Heathrow has accused the authority of undermining the investment needed at the airport. King's coronation procession will be led by a cross that includes relics gifted by the Pope. Uh, King Charles was given two shards of the true cross of Pope Francis to mark the occasion. The shards are said to have come from the cross used in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Uh, small fragments of it have been incorporated into the Cross of Wales, which will be seen by millions as it's carried into Westminster Abbey. This is GB News. More as it happens. Now it is back to Bev and Andrew. Welcome back. Thanks for joining us. It's 11.07. So the latest inflation figures have been released, showing that the rate fell to 10.1% last month, down slightly from 10.4% in February. But food prices are still the problem in the supermarkets. They're soaring, even though wholesale prices have been falling for 12 months. We're joined now by the Contori MP for Wokingham, John Redwood. John Redwood, morning to you. Um, these inflation Good figures were pretty disappointing because we thought, didn't we, they might slip into single figures. Yes, that would have been better news. I think the inflation is on the way down and we'll see a, a lot lower rate by the end of the year, but it's proving a bit sticky. And the sooner it's down, the better, because what we don't want is the Bank of England taking the wrong signal from all of this and intensifying the squeeze and making life even more difficult, because I think they've done quite enough now to tighten up money and credit and to hike interest rates. So you're saying no to another rise in interest rates, John, are you? Better not to have another one, and certainly if they had one more, that should definitely be it. Uh, I think they're probably underestimating the impact of the banking wobbles in, in America and Europe, and that will tighten credit anyway. Banks are going to be much more cautious. Uh, the slowdown is very visible. There's very little growth in the economy now, and people's real incomes have been badly hit. So I don't think we should have another attack upon those taking out mortgages or those companies borrowing money to invest. John, we've seen this morning the consumer price index, the food prices have gone up by nearly 20%. Meanwhile, the wholesale prices the supermarkets are buying those foods for have gone down quite steeply. If the government really wanted to help people, they could do something about that. Well, did it got to know what the government can directly do? I, I think the market will correct. I think the food retailers are pretty tough on the food suppliers, and I guess there are lags in the system. It takes time for the raw material costs to feed through, because, of course, a lot of the food is manufactured, and you've got energy costs and labour costs on top of the underlying food materials. Uh, but I agree, we, we want that food price inflation to come down. So my recommendation to the government is to grow more food at home. I, I'm a bit fed up with them offering grants to farmers to stop growing food and, and now this uh, natural England telling people they shouldn't be grazing their sheep on Dartmoor. I think we want to do the opposite. I think we want to grow more food and graze more animals and have more homegrown food. It, it actually cuts the CO2 compared with all the imports. And I think people like homegrown food and we are short of capacity. We need mm. more food so that the price can come under better control. So you need to support the farmers, first and foremost. We need to get farmers producing more. We've obviously got high price of yeah. fertilisers now because of Ukraine. That's it. So you would very much support that. 
Very much so. I don't think we're spending too much money on stopping farmers farming uh, with all these grants for wilding and all these regulations which impose costs. And I think we should switch that. And I think that money should be used in the way that most other countries use their farming subsidies to promote more food because the, the world population is growing, the UK population is growing with many migrants coming in, more mouths to feed. So let's grow some more food and let's have British food we're proud of. I want a department for food production um, to give more of a, an impetus to all this within DEFRA. I don't think that voice in DEFRA is nearly loud enough. John, can I ask you, some, you and I have talked for many years about what Conservative government should do, small state, low taxes. I don't really sense that's what's happening under Rishi Sunak. Does it feel a very Conservative administration to you? No, I think they could do much more on controlling expenditure. And they, they inherited very generous spending plans in all sorts of areas. Uh, but I think more needs to be done to get better value for money and to concentrate state spending on those things that really need doing and on those people who need most help from the state. I think we've allowed the help to drift too far upwards. I'm not quite sure why we all benefit from uh, control prices and subsidies for our energy bills when people on good incomes uh, could have got by without, for example. Now, that, that will run off. Uh, but if we controlled expenditure better, then maybe the Treasury would cheer up and give us the tax cuts we need. Meanwhile, I think we desperately need the tax cuts to boost the revenue. I, I don't think the Treasury model understands that if you put corporation tax rates up by 31% of what they've just done, you'll end up with less revenue, not more, because businesses will divert their activities overseas or they won't invest here in the growth we need. Again, not just food, we're chronically short of capacity of all kinds, and then we mess up, say, the energy sector so that people don't want to invest enough here. Can I ask, put this to you, John Redwood, that Liz Truss has made the case for low taxes very unpopular because of the way she, because of the cockeyed budget that she brought in last year. Well, I think there were, were difficulties uh, clearly for Liz Truss, and it's a great pity she resigned, and, and we've now got to make the case again in a different way. But my case has always been that I want to tax the rich and the successful companies more, not less. It's just the question of how do you do that? And I can tell you, the way you do it, you have lower rates. Every time in the past a Conservative government cut the top rate of tax, they got more money from the rich, not less. Uh, and every time we cut the corporation tax rate on businesses, we got more money from business. That is the magic ingredient which should be very popular politics. And I would urge Richard Sunak again to study those figures and understand what past Conservative governments have done, what the Republic of Ireland is doing all the time to us, having a very low business tax rate and scooping the pool on business activity and profits is something we should be doing here. If 12.5% is the right business rate for the Republic of Ireland, mm. why do we have to have 25%? How does the government think we're going to attract the investments into Northern Ireland, let alone the rest of GB, uh, if we're charging double the tax of the Republic of Ireland, uh, which as a result raises far more money proportionately from business than we do? John, let me ask you about the illegal immigration catastrophe, which is unfolding at the moment. I don't think I've got time. I really want, I'm going to ask you this question. I really want to know the answer. This legal case today, it's, a, it's a, a very big deal, this case today, with Braintree Council in Essex trying to uh, force through an injunction against the government, putting people on Weathersfield airfield down there. What happens if they are successful? Because that sets the precedent across the country. Well, what happens if they're successful is that the government will look for other options which they think they can get through the courts. But uh, what it tells us uh, is that local government and many people in our country, generous as we are and, and wanting to help refugees, think far too many people are coming in illegally, many of them not refugees at all, but it takes too long to find that out. And they want the government to get better at stopping it. Now, I'm very strongly in favour of what the Prime Minister said. He said he would stop the boat, so let's do it. And I think next week, Parliament has an opportunity to make that easier. And I think the government's going to need a tougher law than the one we've been given in Parliament so far. Because as we know in the past, you, you state in law what you want to do, and then the lawyers and the international bodies get to work and undermine the policy. OK, thank you, John. The voice of common sense, may I say, John Redwood. John Redwood, do you know what's interesting? When we actually interview good Tory MPs, there's a huge amount of common sense, and it feels like there's that team of two. You've got Sunak and Hunt, 
who are driving this government in a very unpopular direction. And well, then you listen to good MPs and... And, and jo John Reid makes the point, you tax the rich more by cutting taxes because they pay more tax. It's called the Laffer Curve, I think, I remember from my economics. Oh, it's nice, isn't it? Now, the National Lottery is famous for supporting good causes. However, a GB News investigation has revealed that the National Lottery Heritage Fund has been used to support political causes, including a speech that described Conservative politicians as devils. Well, Charlie Peters has this exclusive. What would you do with six-figure lottery winnings? It's a question lots of Britons dream about answering. But for a collection of activists, that dream became a reality in 2021 when the National Lottery Heritage Fund awarded almost £250,000 to a group called 81 Acts of Exuberant Defiance. The Social Change Project was launched with support from campaign group the Ubele Initiative to mark the 1981 Brixton riots. The money has helped the group put on 81 different events, which call on people to resist the whitening of our history but GB News can reveal that some of the lottery funding has gone towards supporting a political speech by an activist, breaching the fund's rules. Campaigner Stafford Scott gave a talk at a Brixton venue earlier this month, which accused the royal family of being involved in slavery. He slammed the Met as a gang executing black kids and said the government's crackdown on gangs was fascism. Scott used his lottery-funded talk to describe Boris Johnson and other politicians as devils. And this man, this devil, you know Mopac, right? right? You need to know them, the mud devil, is they are devils, and I'm going to show you that they're devils. This woman's called Sophie Linden. She's the deputy mayor for policing. Right now, right, she a devil. Tory MP Brendan Clark Smith said that lottery funding should not be used to promote political causes. Well, this is the problem, isn't it? I think when people play the lottery, they want to see that money go into good causes, and a lot of it does, of course, and we want to see that spent in our communities properly. What we don't want to see it being used for is these political causes, things that actually cause more tension in the community. And I think that's why it's really, really important not just to look at the applications, but the organisations as well to make sure that this doesn't happen in future. The National Lottery Heritage Fund said they do not define heritage. They leave it up to applicants to make their own understanding of what it is. Do you think that this talk that was funded £4,000 counts as heritage? Well, heritage can mean a lot of things, as we've said there, but I don't think many people would call this heritage at all. And as I said, we want that money to be spent properly. I think a lot of people feel very let down, certainly seeing some of the comments that have been made and where that money is going. But I think this is a wider problem that we've got here. I mean, we have charities, we have community interest companies that really are vehicles for some quite nasty political views. And this is not really where money should be going. It's not in the spirit of the sector. And I think something needs to be done about it. A National Lottery Heritage Fund spokesperson said that its funding should not be used to promote political beliefs, adding that it had been in touch with the Ubele Initiative to discuss how the project would be delivered. They say that your odds of winning the lottery are 1 in 45 million. But it seems that the chances of your £1 going towards funding political activists is much higher. Charlie Peters, GB News, Brixton. Charlie joins us in the studio now. Good morning, Charlie. I'd like to defend the National Lottery. If it wasn't for the National Lottery, my brother couldn't have swum in the Olympics because he got funding. My ex-husband couldn't have rowed in the Olympics because he got funding. They've done some amazing work. Absolutely. And, and the Heritage Fund is currently working on lots of excellent projects. That's mm. hundreds of millions of pounds. Restoring the Iron Bridge in Telford, for example. I visited it last year. I thought it was absolutely sensational, the work they're doing there. And really, the point of this investigation is to make sure that when they do have this funding, yeah. it goes to the right causes. Causes that you mentioned, the Iron Bridge, for example. There are so many others. And unfortunately, we're seeing it go towards this highly political, very controversial, and some are saying rather divisive conversation. How, how how, who is making these decisions, Charlie? Well, that's a freedom of information request that we'll wait to receive. Interesting. Uh, the investigation goes on. Right. But it, it's clear that not sufficient oversight has happened here because the website itself for this 81 acts of exuberant defiance, and it states as one of its aims to resist the whitening of history. Now, that is a very stark political statement, yeah. which clearly breaches the fund's rules, yeah. and it's on the front page of the website, and that's before you even mm. take a moment like I had to sit through the three-hour talk. And it is meant to be overtly apolitical. Precisely. And, and, and I can remember the fuss when John Major said he was going to do it, because Mrs Thatcher would never allow a lottery, because she said it was state-sponsored gambling. 
but she conceded it was a terrific addition to national life. Mm. And as you say, Beds, a great stuff it's done in the Olympics. We used to be rubbish at the Olympic Games. Changed, Get about three medals, and now we're world athletes. beaters. It did. Um, uh, how did Camelot does. respond to when you do these? Well, actually, we, we reached out to the Heritage Fund and they right. said that they'd had an interaction with the Ubele initiative that organised this event. But I think that's clearly insufficient. So many of these remarks were very extreme, some we couldn't even include in the package there. And one, in one case, that the Tories don't give a damn about black people, which is an extraordinary and incendiary accusation to make. £250,000 has gone towards that statement. Have they noticed the colour of the Prime Minister? Well, precisely, indeed. And the Home Secretary? Indeed. And the Foreign Secretary? Well, Indeed. And, and, and further comments, they, they describe that the government's crackdown on gangs as modern-day fascism. They claim that the Equalities and Human Rights Commission was used to hang Jeremy Corbyn. This was charged political content and not uh, what I think people expect their lottery funding to go towards. What do the National Lottery say? We are only defending free speech. You may not agree with them, but they're allowed to say it. Well, they don't define what heritage is. Heritage is a very broad construct. They do very specifically request that heritage does not make overt party political content, mm. which this, this clearly breaches. Yeah. I mean, the Equality Human Rights Commission did a very, very significant landmark report on anti-Semitism in the Labour Party. Precisely, and, and it, it concluded that the leadership had not acted sufficiently and to claim that the Tories kind of fixed that up. Again, another overt breach of the funds rules. Well, and it was Keir Starmer who kicked Corbyn out of the Labour Party, yes, not indeed. the Tories. Yes, indeed. He has to redirect his ire, I think, that speaker. Yeah, indeed. Charlie Peter, great report. Thanks, Charlie. A uh, couple of your uh, views. Colin whizzes about the eco-protesters. Colin says the actions and proposed actions of climate protesters is appalling and self-defeating, no matter how strongly they feel. The actions are unacceptable. We're going to be looking at that again as well in the next hour, but also still to come. Uh, the UK's largest anti-monarchy group has revealed what phrase they want thousands of people to chant at the coronation. We'll tell you what it is in just a moment. This is TV News. I joined GB News because I was sick and tired of not hearing my views being represented, not just mine, but so many people that I knew and spoke to. I just couldn't get my voice out there. I couldn't say anything, I couldn't do anything. Whatever the narrative was, I kind of had to follow it. GB News is there to provide a voice for those who have been ignored by the establishment media. We think different things, we've got a different style. GB News is here to be optimistic and positive about the future. It's real kind of dynamic and flowing with the audience very much at the heart of it, like a big family. Here at GB News, we talk about the things that matter to you. Hearing the voices from right across our towns and cities, especially our towns. All sides of the argument represented with a heavy dose of opinion. We're on a mission here to make a difference. And the GB News family really is here for you and whatever time of day you can watch or listen. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. We're proud to be GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Westminster is going around in ever-decreasing circles, followed by the media. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? Join me at 7pm, Monday to Thursdays, on Farage, here on GB News. We will have open, rational debate. We've got to work out how Britain moves forward from this. Join us here on GB News, the people's channel. Britain is watching. You've probably seen politicians interviewed a thousand times, but we do it differently. We find out who they really are. We don't shout, we chat, and hopefully we bring a bit of light, not just heat. Did you All know Kate Moss? Apparently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> do you have a pair of jeans or a pair of jeans? <laughs> no. no, of course I don't. What would I do with them? My friends are like, oh my God, what's she doing now? Join me every Sunday at six for Gloria Meets, only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Jacob Rees-Mogg, the Member of Parliament for North East Somerset and a former Government Minister. For years I've walked the corridors of power in both Westminster and the City of London. We need to have the arguments, the discussions on how we make it better. Crop failures, famine, war, <laughs> suffering on a scale completely <laughs> unimaginable. We are putting the cart before the horse. As Charles I said of the scaffold, he was the true defender of liberty. Yeah, I've completely derailed the conversation. <laughs> Join me Monday to Thursday at 8pm on GB News, Britain's news channel. 
I'm Mark White. As GB News Home and Security Editor, I cover those key issues that are so important to you. Our authorities, our communities doing all they can to combat violent crime. With the public services under unbearable strain, why are we still failing to control our borders? Defence, the first priority of any government, has been continually hollowed out. Can we trust our politicians to protect the armed forces? Join me, Mark White, on GB News. Good morning. Look what I've got hot off the press. The brochure for the coronation. Cameron Walker, is it called a brochure? An official souvenir programme. Oh, it's, oh, it's a programme, it's not a brochure. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, that is, but this is real history, the first coronation since 1953. And how do they refer to Camilla in there? Well, they refer to her as Queen Camilla. There Not is no mention consort. of the Queen Consort. Uh, we're always led to believe that perhaps after the coronation, we would be referring to her as the Queen and yeah. Queen Camilla rather than the Queen Consort. And it looks like He's the jumped printing the gun. press... We've ju yeah, they jumped the gun a bit on that well, one. Well, but... Charles was always going to have... His wife was always going to be his Queen. Yeah, absolutely. Always. Absolutely, Even absolutely. though when it was announced in 2005 they were getting engaged and it, the palace announced it is intended she will be known as Princess Consort. I wrote in the Times, where I was at the time, not true. She'll be the Queen. I think it was a, a kind of a subtle, um, a, a, a subtle way to kind of bring her into the public to, to make sure that the public were happy with the because term it was, Queen it was a, And it was only eight years after the death of Diana. And what they couldn't call her, of course, was the Princess of Wales. Yes, and if you remember back in February 2022, the Queen, the late Queen's accession day message, she, she said it was her sincere wish that Camilla would one day be known as Queen Consort. Yeah. As soon as the uh, Queen died, the first Buckingham Palace statement announcing the Queen's death referred to the King and Queen Consort. And we have seen this gradual transition mm. to the acceptance of Queen Camilla, and that is what we all get. There's adverts in it, Cameron. Yeah. I didn't quite, I didn't quite expect that. Where Making are money, aren't here, they? I think. They want to um, make it cost-effective. Yeah, it's got they Land do. Rover, Hackett, Marks and Spencers, Burberry. They're sort of quite poshish brands, aren't they? There's... You know, yeah, brands that are used the by, the, by the royals. Exactly. Yeah, so brands with the royal warrants. Yeah. Um, I'm also told that this programme, that some of the profits of it are very much going to charity. So well, it's good. not pocket, being pocketed by the royal family in any way. Um, one of the significant things is the papers have talked about over the last few days is the inclusion of this photograph. Harry, Meghan, the then Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, their three children, and Charles and Camilla as well, taken in 2018 by the royal photographer <laughs> Chris Jackson. Um, five years ago. Five years ago. Looks like very happy families in that photograph, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, not so very happy um, family behind the scenes. As Harry speaks about at length in his memoir, this would have been post baby brain comments from uh, Meghan yeah. reported baby brain comments which reportedly upset the Duchess of Cambridge so there was falling out perhaps over bridesmaids dresses as well uh, and all of that but I think it's interesting that the king has chosen because of course he would have had to have signed this off because it's the official Buckingham Palace program uh, that um, he has chosen a picture of Harry and Meghan to be featured in it. Um, the papers have, have, peace talked, have put the, the peace offering. Olive Branch has been talked about yeah. as well. I think this perhaps might be the beginning of the end of the feud, or at least that's what Buckingham Palace will be hoping. I doubt that. Really? They've got all these Netflix uh, contracts and she, there's talk of another book, talk that she might do another book. I can't see it coming. I think it's wishful thinking. Maybe it is wishful it's done. thinking. Let's ask Michael Cole, because he's a great royal commentator and expert. Michael Cole, what are, do you, are you with me? There's no prospect of this feud coming to an end, in my view. Absolutely not. Uh, the two brothers, uh, William will not be speaking to his uh, younger brother at all. Uh, the hurt's too deep. What has been said uh, in the book, Spare, and on, on television has been too cruel, too wounding, uh, and too personal. The sort of things that should never have actually been taken outside the family and should have been resolved within it. So I think there's no prospect of that. Maybe never. I hate to say never, but I think that is the stark truth we have to look at because uh, what Harry has done is totally unprecedented. Never before. Members of the royal family, if they've even, you know, the Duke of Windsor wrote uh, his book, A King's Story, that was very, very circumspect in, in what he said. 
Michael, have you got your souvenir programme yet or have we even beaten you to it? <laughs> Well, I'm so glad that you said that they're, that, that they're obviously making a profit with it uh, and uh, the adverts are there. Do you know, in 53, um, there were 8,000 people. I don't know how. They must have used a big shoehorn to get them inside the Abbey, but there were 8,000 people. And everybody who was there, the peers of the realm, were allowed to buy their chairs afterwards. And the, and the coronation made a profit. I think it was five pounds. They were rather... Lovely sort of light blue uh, velvet chairs. In fact, uh, we used to live in a place called Summerlake, and there were two of them in Summerlake Hall because Lord and Lady Summerlake bought the chairs that they sat in at the coronation. But as we've talking about money, and you've mentioned it uh, themselves, I mean, Mr. Sunak uh, wants us to do some. So let me give you a sum, I pay. Uh, the coronation is going to cost a hundred million pounds and it's going to bring in one billion pounds. Now that's a profit of 900 billion pounds, and I believe that's 90%. Now even Goldman Sachs doesn't make a profit of 90%. So let's get that out of the way. But it's really not a question of pounds and pence. Man does not live by bread alone. This is a very spiritual, and constitutionally vital moment. It's the most important moment for 70 years. And because it's symbolic, Michael. Sorry to interrupt you, but we want to ask you about, we're talking at the symbolism, this little piece of Christ's cross, which is now going to play a role in the day. What do you make of that? Well, I love your interventions at any time. <laughs> very, very welcome. <laughs> Let me just explain that uh, His Holiness the Pope has given as a gift, a precious gift to the King, uh, two fragments of the Holy Cross, the cross upon which Christ was crucified at Calvary. And they have been mounted by great skill of the Goldsmiths Company of this country into the Welsh Cross. And that will be born uh, into the Abbey. Now, of course, the, the, things of this kind uh, are very, very important, particularly in the Catholic Church, less so in the Church of England. But this is very important. And of course, uh, John Calvin, the great uh, reformer, the great Protestant reformer from Switzerland, he said there are enough elements and pieces of the Holy Cross around the world uh, to fill a ship. But we have to accept, and obviously the Pope believes, and I'm sure the King believes, that these are fragments of the Holy Cross on which Christ was crucified all those years ago and rose uh, again from the dead uh, and then ascended to heaven. So this is a very important spiritual moment. It's the most important moment that happens. And it's often said, and I'm sure Andrew can back me up, we, we don't have a written constitution, okay. but we do have a coronation. And that is central to everything we ever do. Mm. Because Westminster says to government, King is their head of state. Parliament is sovereign, and they work together. And over the years, and it goes back a thousand years, it hasn't done too badly for this country. Yeah. Quite Michael, agreed. Thank you so much. Michael Cole, always a pleasure. Um, we've run out of time, Cameron Walker. Next time, if you can bring in that little cross, you'll get extra yeah. prizes from me and Andrew. And I'm a committed, <laughs> as can I say, as a committed Roman Catholic, I love the idea it's a fragment of the crucifix, but I'm not sure it is. I kind of like, I like it. But it's that. a lovely idea. It's a lovely, it's a lovely idea. The whole day, it's all symbolism, the whole it occasion, is. isn't it? Anyway, still to come, Lord Hague said that women should ease their concerns over trans fears. Do you what's agree? It, what's it got to do with him? We'll find out after your morning's news with Aaron Armstrong. All right, good morning to you. It's 11.34. I'm Aaron Armstrong in the GB Newsroom. UK inflation has fallen, but not by as much as expected with food prices at a 45-year high. The cost of living was predicted to ease, but inflation currently stands at 10.1%, down from 10.4% the previous month. Savings on lower fuel costs have been cancelled out by soaring prices for bread, cereal and fruit. Clothing and footwear prices have also gone up. 
The odds of the Bank of England raising interest rates again next month have jumped. The government's plans for an asylum centre in Essex will be challenged in the High Court today. Braintree District Council argues the proposed site at RAF Weathersfield is unsuitable due to its isolated location and lack of capacity for local services. The government says using disused military bases to accommodate migrants will reduce reliance on hotels. The Prime Minister says disruptive climate protesters should be ashamed of themselves. Rishi Sunak's comments come after activists disrupted the World Snooker Championship on Monday and delayed the Grand National at the weekend. Speaking to The Sun, Mr Sunak says those who disrupt sporting events ruin the hard work of others and should be ashamed of their selfish behaviour. The King's coronation procession will include a cross uh, that itself includes relics gifted by the Pope. King Charles was given two shards of the true cross by Pope Francis to mark the occasion. And those shards are said to have come from the cross used in the crucifixion of Christ. The small fragments have been incorporated into the Cross of Wales, which will be seen by millions when it's carried in to Westminster Abbey. TV, online, DAB and TuneIn Radio. This is GB News. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for gold and silver investment. And a quick snapshot of today's uh, markets. The pound will buy you $1.2421 and 1.1361 euros. And the price of gold is uh, £1,588.53 per ounce. And the FTSE 100 is at 7878 points. Direct Bullion sponsors the Finance Report on GB News for physical investment. Welcome back to To The Point on GB News. Now, while Women's Institute members push back against plans to let anyone who says they are a woman join, a former Conservative leader of all people has told them to get over it. We're going to discuss more, that and more on our papers panel next on GB News. And by the way, Lord Hague, when you make, leave it to the WI. <laughs> Monday to Thursday nights on GB News. At 6, it's Deebs & Co. 7 o'clock, Farage. At 8, join Jacob Rees-Mogg. And at 9, Dan Wooten tonight, followed by headliners. On TV, radio and online, this is GB News. First and foremost, I am a GB News fan, and I was before I was working here. Just love the fact that we're asking the questions that a lot of establishment media won't ask. With a bit of a twist, we not only want to inform you, but we want to keep you entertained. It's worth the drive because you get in and the team's already in waiting, they're itching to go, and it's a proper little family. GB News is the people's channel. It's the audience that makes the programme sing. We're giving our viewers and our listeners a voice. I see the thousands of your letters, tweets, emails, you name it, coming in. Britain is broken. How on earth did we get into this mess? But more importantly, how do we get out of it? The establishment had their chance. Now we're here to represent you. It's time for something different. It's time for GB News. I'm very patriotic. I believe in Britain. Our best days lie ahead. Britain's watching. Britain's watching. Join us here on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's news channel. Join me, Patrick Christie's Monday to Friday, three till six. We tackle the day's news agenda like you've never seen before. It's high tempo, high octane, the most controversial topics and the best guests. You will not be able to take your eyes and ears off it. I'm not afraid to ask the questions that you really want answered. Three till six p.m. Monday to Friday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. GB News has its own late night paper preview show, Headliners, where comedians take you through the next day's top news stories. You don't have to bother reading the newspaper, we've got it covered for you. Headliners, every night at 11 p.m. and repeated every morning at 5 a.m. We won't send you to sleep like some of the other paper review shows out there. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, on Sunday mornings from 9.30, taking the politicians to task and breaking out of SW1 to see how their decisions are affecting you across the UK. Bursting the Westminster bubble every Sunday morning, only on GB News, the People's Channel. Britain's watching.
Hello, I'm Calvin Robinson. Do not miss my Common Sense Crusade Saturdays at 7 p.m. Join me for some in-depth discussions on faith. Is that not the start of the slippery slope? It's very much so. And the big moral questions of the day. <laughs> I'm baffled. You've got some nerve. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Well, we're talking about the papers and a uh, big story in one of the papers about William Hague. Used to... I think we're just going to go to Tom first. Oh, we're going to Tom first. Sorry, we are. Forgive me. Tom, Tom Harwood. Harwood. What's on your show today, Tom? That's right, it's a very busy show uh, today. Of course, we're kicking off with Prime Minister's questions, looking ahead to what on earth is going to be discussed between Rishi Sunak and Sir Keir Starmer. Might it be that investigation, that parliamentary standards investigation into the Prime Minister? Or, as it has been reported, might MPs have been told off for talking about that by the Speaker? There's also the SNP drama that is going on right now. The front page of the Scottish Sun this morning asks, will Nick be nicked. Might the Prime Minister bring up the turmoil in that party? Very interesting to listen to what Stephen Flynn, the leader of that group in the Commons, has to say after, of course, that main exchange. But it's not just Prime Minister's questions today. There's other big, big stories as well. GB News has, of course, this exclusive story on where lottery funding is going. Is it funding political activism, particularly left-wing political activism. We'll be speaking more with Charlie Peters about that. But there are other big, big stories as well. This small boat story, the scandal on the south coast of England. Might it be declared an emergency, a small boat emergency by the Home Secretary in a court case today? We'll be getting a lot more on that. And, of course, the big story that's ripping through our wallets right now, inflation. New numbers out, uh, almost 20% food inflation. We'll be getting diving into those details with Liam Halligan as well. It's all to come from just before 12. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we are here with the stories and also the big stories of the day and also director of the Common Sense Society, Emma Webb, and former Labour MP Stephen Pound are still with us. Right. What do we want to start with, guys? Lord Haig? Come on. What's he doing? women of the WI to get over their trans fears. Well, th th this has been a joke for some time, isn't it, that, that people have said, oh, well, it'll be the WI next, it'll be the Women's Institute. Well, actually, now this is the case. Um, it's been imposed from above by the WI. Members haven't voted on it. Um, what, that they that, can't, that, that they that, must be a, a, a willing any, to allow any, trans any women? A person who is living as a woman... Um, can join the WI. So obviously this includes biological men. Um, there are a lot of people who are members of the W people, women who are members of the WI, um, who are opposed to this. They're signing a, a petition yeah. um, wanting this to be put to a vote. And William Haig, in, in the outrageous interview, um, has essentially said that even though he believes that um, trans women should be allowed to compete in women's sports, he's essentially dismissed concerns and said really that the, the WI can like it or lump it, this is just modern Britain and they just have to accept these things. Um, and I think um, people like Caroline Fisk, who's been very vocal about this, um, made a very good Who's point. Caroline Fisk? Just uh, she is. She uh, is, I think you could probably describe her as being a sort of pro-women's rights, same-sex based activist. Mm. Um, and she uh, quite rightly has pointed out that we have a right to association in this country. That means a right to associate with people who are of the same sex. This should be up to the WI. Yeah. William Hague should absolutely keep his nose out of the WI's business. I completely business office. agree. Um, and I think that, you know, Ca Caroline Fisk is absolutely bang on the money with this, that William Hague really should just should butt out um, and yeah. they should be allowed to make this decision for themselves it's as the, members. It's called the Women's Institute. It's and it on does, the tin. It seems like a kind of stereotypical. You joke, could hardly make but. this up. But, but, here, but we go, here we go. But I think this is very, very different to male-born human beings competing in sport. If you are a middle-aged 
biologically born male who has transitioned to being a female and you want to go and bake some cakes on a Sunday afternoon in your local church, I don't honestly think the members of the WI would be so small-minded that they wouldn't but, want yeah, but, 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 but it should be up to them, not up to William Hague. It shouldn't be imposed. But this is the yeah, problem with exactly. this debate, isn't it, well, Stephen, is that it's become so... Because of the trans activists making this such a difficult and divisive yeah. issue and being so aggressive about a lot of their messaging, mm -hmm. it, has, it means that people like William Hague have to get involved. Well, may I... Not always in a positive way. May I sound a note of caution? Um, I was an MP under Tony Blair when he addressed the Women's Institute he did. about 20 years ago. And believe he was you, me, William, do not mess with yeah. the WI. He was slow handcuffs. They are ferocious. I mean, we thought of them as a rather delightful group of people obsessed with jam and Jerusalem and a bit of home knitting. Little did we realise. They monstered us. <laughs> they did. They turned up at our surgeries, they flooded our inboxes, and they made life... Good. Yeah. Oh, and no, it, fair, and it was because he went to the Women's Institute and, Congress and, and was party political and patronised women. Well, yeah. Uh, anyway, it, and they slow hand clapped him. Unprecedented. Indeed, which is an extraordinary situation. Amazing. Particularly the WI around my own, basically, a sort of, you know, sort of the female wing of the Conservative Party. You could put the WI in number 10 and number 11 yeah. Downing Street, and I reckon they'd sort this country out in 48 hours. Well, sensible. I, I just think. <gasps> It should be their choice, the members' choice, not some executive telling Absolutely. them whether they will accept or not. Well, that's an internal and, matter and for is, the WI. It is. I'm sorry. If, but it's, yeah. Speaking of freedom of association, is there nowhere that I can go anymore for jam and Jerusalem? You know? yeah. The WI is the WI, and I think, yeah. and, and I, I think there is a very important point to be made here, though, which is that this is this is not just about the WI. This is about gender ideology. This is about women's spaces in general. It's not to make the distinction between women's sports just because there's a competitive advantage in women's sports, and that's not the nature of the WI, misses the, the, the point, which is that if you allow people who identify as women, men who identify as women, into women's spaces like the Women's Institute, can, do you allow them into prisons? I can, do you yeah, I can hardly, you know, I can hardly believe we're having this discussion. It's let so me give you, absurd. Let me give you a real-life example. I play netball, and there's an organisation called Back to Netball. Netball's had a, a brilliant increase in women of my age who used to play netball. We've right. all gone back. And one day, the coach came to us and she said, right, ladies, it's meant to be women only. We've been approached by a trans woman that wants to come and play. Mm. How do you all feel about it? Now, of course, this was a few years. We all sniggered a bit, and, and somebody made some jokes about drop balls and various things that <laughs> British people do, right? And we said, sure, she can come and play. We don't mind. It's, it's fun netball. Yeah. Like, we're, not, oh, we're yeah. not after Olympic medals. When were here. you ever not competitive? Mm. But that's your decision. <laughs> that's not a top-down policy. Yeah. But that was in... But, but with, yes, it's but not against... It wasn't the Netball Association telling you you had to what, have what this decide? trans woman no, in your you team. Decide? So, the, the 16, 18, 20... Women, we all went, yeah, sure, why not? Because I think that's what most of the WI would do. Anyway, this individual arrives, born male, transitioned to female, hair in a ponytail, clearly male genetics. She had, I'm not joking, the best morning of her life. And she came to us and she had tears in her eyes and she said, This is all I've ever wanted to do from being at school. I've wanted to play netball. She was in her 40s, maybe 50. She didn't come back. But she had but that was the your best decision. morning, and yeah. I thought we did the right thing. We yeah. weren't chasing yeah. the gold medals. But isn't it interesting? It's, I mean, uh, William Hague is a big friend of Sebastian Coe, Lord Coe, yeah, yeah. who's president of the, of the World Athletics now. They used uh, to do and, judo together, and, and indeed they were. And, and there was the, a lot of this is to do with uh, William Hague's position for supporting Sebastian Coe on transgender women in sport. Yeah. And I think that he's actually blurred the lines here. Yeah. He's, he's, he'll actually we were coming back from this quite quickly and saying, actually, sorry, no, I think I misspoke. I think he did. Your story is absolutely beautiful. Do you know yeah. there's a TV series there, isn't there? Yeah, there is. Cool yeah, th Netball. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. This. Oh, yeah. But, but, that's yeah. The point. but I think you needed the player to play more than once. And, and, and would I have wanted to, you know, I mean, even though they were clearly physically male, would I have wanted to be bouncing up against them in a competitive game when yeah. I'm goal defence and shit? And did you share a, no, I wouldn't. But did you share a changing room with this? No, individual? we didn't. Really rock up in our kit after the school run. Because that's when it gets complicated. Mm -hmm. Then you sit on the boot of your cars and put your trainers on, isn't it? Yeah. It's that's really what we fun. do for football. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's really fun. You don't play football. Of course I do. Walking football. But I think we have to be really careful with this conversation, and I think it is, it is not necessarily wise of William Hague to get involved. Uh, I think it's a and terrible you know what? I mistake. I think I have a problem with what he said, Emma. It's the dismissive nature. Yeah. Get over yourselves. Well, yeah. It's more complicated than that, William Hague. It's, and it's, we have... it's a great organisation, the Women's Institute, but it does great, important Amazing charity work. work in the community, oh, no, yeah. and I think he's belittling them. Yeah, yeah absolutely. He knows best. I think it's patronising, mm. and I and I 
And I really do think that, you know, this is a, this is about a much bigger issue about men, biological men going into yeah. women's spaces. It's fine, make decisions on a case-by-case -case basis, as you did, yeah. Um, yeah. but to have a top-down policy that is, is, hasn't been voted on and is against the will of yeah. many members of the WI. Well, the green, the green for WI are spitting feathers, believe you. Yes, There will Stephen. be trouble at the fate this summer. <laughs> Quite right. <laughs> that's Stephen. Yeah. Oh, wait, that's, a, that's a TV programme right there. Uh, right, thank you so much both, Emma and Stephen. That was quick. Very quick. Oh, it's Q PMQs, that's why. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So stay tuned. Thanks to Emma and Stephen. Up next is GB News Live with Tom Hardy's going to look at PMQs. This is To The Point with Andrew and Bev. We'll be back tomorrow at 9.30. See you then. Hello, Alex Deegan here with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Most of us having a dry day today. Quite a few of us seeing blue skies through the afternoon as well. But there is an easterly breeze still bringing a bit of a chill to some North Sea coast. Thanks to this area of high pressure sitting to the north, the uh, wind going around the high pressure clockwise, so drawing in that chilly feel on these North Sea coasts. But for the west, in the sunshine again, western Scotland probably seeing the highest temperatures. Quite a bit of cloud over England as well. Seen some showers this morning over the southwest. They are tending to drift away now, so most places will be dry, staying fairly cloudy over parts of the West Midlands, Wales and southwest England, but turning sunnier over eastern England and plenty of sunshine for Scotland, Northern Ireland and Northern England. 18, 19 in Western Scotland, 11 or 12 on that east coast, that will feel pretty fresh. It'll turn quite t chilly overnight as well as the cloud tends to melt away in most places. We'll see a bit of cloud developing over the Pennines, but uh, generally it'll be dry and clear through the night. Enough of a breeze to stop temperatures dropping too far, but it will be quite a fresh start to Thursday morning. Some pockets of frost possible across parts of Scotland uh, through the sheltered glens.